my good friend, officer, special agent. Just kidding. Which uh, is it? <laughs> whatever you want it to be. Uh, Greg Kading back in. Thank you so much for your hey, time, man. Tommy. Always make me smile when I see you. Yeah, me too, man. It feels good to be back. I like what you've done to the place. It's a little bit different. I love, I love all the new additions. Yeah, we it keep adding. Them. I think we're done adding now, though. Are you? Yeah. No, yeah. you'll find something. I'm else. sure I will. It'll be a mess. <laughs> It'll be more of a mess when you come back in. Now, aren't you sick of all this Tupac and Biggie? <sighs> it just it does. It never starts, ends. It never ends, and it maybe it never will, but it just starts to feel very redundant at some point because. The story doesn't really change as far as the facts of the case. Um, and you can reiterate it and reiterate it and reiterate it. The, the conspiracy theories are still going to stay alive. People just want to believe that there's more to it than there was. And the, the answers were actually relatively simple. So just to recap, if somebody didn't see you on TV, your book, documentary, a thousand places, instead of me trying to do it, being that you... Uh, interviewed a lot of these guys. Uh, we'll start with Tupac. Okay. So recap that <clears throat> situation. So he's at the Tyson fight. Mm -hmm. It started over a necklace. Is that correct if I remember right? Well, yeah, there was an incident with a chain that preceded the fight that happened at the MGM. But the actual conflict goes back even further. You know, they, Death Row and Bad Boys were at odds. Biggie and Tupac were at odds. And then the people that they associated with were at odds. So there was just different levels to it. And it all culminated in Tupac being shot. But that night at the MGM, Orlando Anderson, was he the head of the Crips at the time? No, he was not. He was a, a, a serious enforcer for his clique of um, gang members, the Southside Crips. Probably if there were a leader, it would have been his uncle, Keefe D, who also happened to be in the car the same with with orlando the night when tupac was shot he actually had handed the gun to his nephew in the back seat so he was kind of the shot caller so now did you ever get a chance to interview or interrogate orlando before he got killed no no by the time i got <laughs> by the time i got on the case which is in 2006 it's already almost 10 years after the fact orlando died in 98 he was shot in an unrelated gang type of action so he was long gone. So that still stands. He was killed non-related to the Tupac incident. None. Street shit. Yeah, he just got into it with some guys trying to collect a drug debt. Everyone pulled out guns. Three of the four people in that conflict uh, confrontation died. Orlando was the last man standing. He actually got charged for all three deaths based uh -huh. on some we, felony murder rule in, Los, you know, in L.A. and California. And... Uh, Orlando ultimately was shot and killed. I'm sorry, his buddy at the time, a guy named Michael Giroux, ended up being charged with all three murders. Orlando was shot and killed at the time, yeah. But, you know, the one thing, and I asked you on the phone, I know, can you pull up uh, tab three? It's the picture of the Tupac car. It might be two. Um, <clears throat> when you zoomed in on those shots, did those not look like marksman shots to you? Because, I mean, they're all body shots. Like, no matter where you move, that's going to hit an organ yeah no not really if you look at it you see one through the front windshield and you see through a few through the door and then there's a couple through the back door so you can see it's a moving target mm -hmm. and so the the um the first shot is in the front and as the car is going by uh, it begins to translate back towards the the rear or it could happen in reverse maybe the shots start in the rear and go towards the front as they're pulling away so no this isn't like some type of you know but it just looks like somebody's going bang 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 all low shots all organ definitely gonna hit so no matter where you move you're done for well but they're not i mean you see one in the windshield you see one under the uh, side view mirror you see a, a group of them in the door, the door, and then there's actually ones behind that. So it's not as concentrated as just that central group there. It's spread out. How, how many shots were fired approximately, do you know? I, I think 13. 13? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, so we're, we were kind of just focusing on those four by the door. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they move because Tupac's in is stack, uh, you know, the car stationary. The vehicle driving by starts to begin or starts to um, fire, and then 
as that vehicle passes the BMW, the shots are boom, boom, they move forward, concentrate a little bit, and then you can even see from the windshield, he's actually shooting back now. Oh, okay. As they've passed. I see. <clears throat> now it makes more sense when it's explained like that. Mm -hmm. Do you get it more now? Yeah. yeah I, I, there was that one picture. See if though. you can find a better picture. Do you remember the picture yeah. that we had? <clears throat> I don't. It's I'll, look, I'll look for it, yeah. yeah. There, there was one picture where they really zoom in, mm -hmm. and I mean, it really looks like, I mean, like a Navy SEAL drove by and did it. I'll look for it. If you only look at that concentrated grouping, then yeah, you'd come with it like, wow, that was really well-placed shots but when you look at the hole you realize well there's a shot here and a shot here and a shot here and a shot here and it starts to spread out and that's indicative of something where a vehicle is passing by and the shots are now being placed um, in different areas based on the movement of the cars which now we know from the testimony of one of the individuals in the assailant's vehicle is that the car was moving they pull up boom you know, maybe he starts to shoot as they're pulling up. The car slows to a point where now he can concentrate it, and they're pulling away quickly, and now there's more shots that are being left behind, and that's why you have one under that, the... Under the wind, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Now... Like, when, imagine yourself being in that position. You're in a car, you lean out, and you're moving. Boom, boom, boom. The cars, the, the, the shots are going to start misplacing themselves right 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 yeah see we were just focusing in on yeah. that one area four. really digging in but that, mm -hmm. that was maybe four or five of the 13. Mm -hmm. now when you got on the only person that was left was keefe right keefe d no the driver terrence brown was still alive at the time oh, he's he since passed but yeah he was still alive at the time that keefe d confessed to his involvement and to kind of go back to your point not to belabor it but no 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 think about this um if you were a really, you know, a, a marksman, you know, a trained assassin, would you put the bullets in the lower part of the door or would you put them through the upper part of the door in the window where the individual's upper body and torso is going to be versus his lower torso? See, I would have done the body because I'm guessing he's going to move around. So I would get all the organs that I could. Mm hmm. Well, again, this this is a little bit subjective, but I would think if the theory is that this is a really sharp sharpshooter, a marksman, the bullets aren't going to be in the lower parts of the door. They're going to be in the upper parts of the door. Okay, so you know more than me. I uh, I don't know. Yeah. But you would be shooting towards the upper torso. Right. Shooting right. You'd be head. shooting up or not right. so low. The right. things you could see. Yeah, try to hit him in the head. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And then when you got around to the case, you had two people left, right? The one's passed now, and then Keefe. Right. Okay. And then how did Keefe get out of all this? Well, like, he hasn't necessarily. He confessed to us under these conditions wherein he could tell us what happened without the, the fear of incriminating himself. Well, then he goes outside of that agreement and starts talking publicly about his role in the murder. He writes a book. He's going on podcasts. Remember we were he's, talking about that? Yeah. Last time you heard, me and you were, I was saying, what is this guy doing? Yeah. Like, just leave, bro. <laughs> he must have thought he had some type of immunity, mm -hmm. which he never did. He had a misunderstanding. And now <laughs> I think he's going to suffer the consequences <laughs> of that misunderstanding because um, now everything that he's said publicly can be held against him. Mm -hmm. And so there's a grand jury going on in Las Vegas right now. They've done a search warrant at his house. Like this whole thing's like revitalized itself. And Keefe D is now going to face the music of uh, his own public declarations. Now, when you sat with him, what did he tell you? And what did you believe from him that he told you? I believed everything he told us. Oh, you think he was 100% honest? I do. Honest? Really? Yeah, yeah, I do. And we went into a lot of things that weren't necessarily Tupac related. Just a, we, we built a, 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 a scenario wherein he had to tell the truth because if he lied about anything, then everything was off the table. And he's already facing a life sentence. Mm -hmm. And so it's only in his best interest to tell the truth. So if he comes in there and lies about anything, then he's going to prison for life. Right. His yeah. best hope is to tell the truth. And he doesn't know what we know. Mm -hmm. So when he's talking to us, you know, <laughs> if he lies, he doesn't know they're going to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I believe it all to be true. 
And it's also consistent with the known facts. Everything we know about the case makes perfect sense when it's told through his, through his uh, um, story. So, and through, how did he word it to you, if, if you're allowed to, to say what he said? So he tells us that th th there's this ongoing tension going back and forth between um, Tupac, Biggie, Suge, Puffy, and the gangs that are associated with them, which were Crip and Blood gangs, which are already, you know, by nature at odds. He says, you know, blood has already been spilt. You know, one of the guys from the bad boy camp has already killed one of the guys from the, you know, death row camp. And uh, a guy named Jake Robles, who was killed in Atlanta. The conflict's been going on. There's been other shootings. There's been, you know, basically um, physical confrontations at different award shows, public humility of one another when Suge gets up on the stage and talks about basically, you know, trying to recruit all the bad boy guys to come to death row. So this is just kind of fueling the fire. Ultimately, a couple of Crips and Bloods get into a confrontation where a, a necklace, is, a death row medallion is stolen, and that leads us to Vegas. And so he tells the history of all of this in, 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 in first, you know, uh, first person. He's telling us the history of all this going on and what he was understanding about it all. And then he says, when we got to Vegas, we went out there with no intentions of having any issues. But... When Tupac assaulted my nephew at the MGM, that put everything into motion, right? My nephew's going to get even for that no matter what. He's a bona fide gangster. That's, that can't go unanswered. And he says, but we're also considering like this offer made to us that if we did something about Tupac's and Suge Knight's, you know, conflict, um, we could benefit financially. So that puts everything into motion. They go into... Uh, um, kind of a hunt to find out where Tupac's at, and they ultimately encounter them on the off the strip. Next thing you know, a gun gets pulled out, Tupac gets shot and killed, Suge takes a grazing wound to the neck, and the rest is history. It was relatively simple. Let's face it. After a night with drinks, I don't bounce back the next day like I used to. I have to make a choice, either a great night or a great next day. That is until I found Z-Botics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste the day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's of sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Order Zbiotics now for your summertime barbecue, weddings, vacations, you name it. Go to zbiotics.com slash mscsmedia or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use MSCS Media checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee, so if you're ever unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money no questions asked. Remember, Head to zbiotics.com slash mscsmedia. Use the code mscsmedia at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you a man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30% lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss, you name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So, 
If you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS Media and get 25% off your test using the code MSCS Media. The link is in the description at the top. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, remember the days when you're always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up, bluechew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever the opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, aqua conversations, waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Does it work? Don't think you need it? Try it free for a month and see. You're going to love it. You could be missing the best sex of your life. They say there's nothing sexier than confidence. And Blue Chew can help give you the confidence where it counts. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use the promo code MSCS at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code MSCS to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank BlueChew for sponsoring the podcast. So now after that fight, right? So they already knew that there was a financial gain on the table, possibly. Mm-hmm. So after that fight, do they make a call and say, hey, look, we?" because they already know that Orlando is going to do what he's going to do no matter right, what. Right. So do they make that call to get the money too? In no. In that time period? No, the call comes later, like oh, two or shit. three, after they get back to Los Angeles from L.A., uh-huh. a, a call comes in from from uh, Combs asking, shit, was that us? Was that us? He's talking to Keefe D. And uh, he says, you know, was that us? Did that shit that just happened in Vegas, did that have something to do with what we talked about? And so that is where it becomes a little bit, you know, incriminating on Puffy's part. Well, you know me from, mm-hmm. from the day I met you. I said, I know it's Puffy. And I, you know, I, in some way, shape or form, I guess. And there was nothing you could do with that because I get because you just have a statement, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you've got the statement of this guy who's um, a documented gang member. He's told different stories versions of the story before um yeah so there's credibility issues but also and i all always try to add this caveat is that within the context of this conflict i don't think puffy was ever seriously like hey man i want to have a contractual relationship with you i'll give you money go kill these guys Mm -hmm. it's just this kind of talking out your ass type of thing where, man, fuck these men. Can you help me out? Take care of this. Not really thinking that it would culminate into an actual murder. I see. Like, like you're out at the bar and you're like, yeah. man, I'd love to kill that fucker. Right. You know, he's driving mm-hmm. nuts. He's giving, yeah. you know, I got all these problems. I just, I would give a million dollars to get rid of him. That's, and then next thing you know, it happens. Then he Where's calls my million? like, yeah. was yeah. that, yeah. What, what, did, did that just happen? And was was that from me? Was that us? I see what you're saying. Yeah, I yeah. Think so kind of like saying it under his breath, then it turns into something. Then these gang members think, "Oh, well, we're gonna do it anyway, so let's make a buck." And then there, that's how it goes. Yeah, exactly. And there's like this soft version of extortion, knowing like, "Well, we did this, and he did solicit this in a you know under uh, his breath, under type his breath, of way. Type. and yeah. so." He doesn't want to mess with us, so I'm sure we can get him to pay us the money that, you know, that he suggested. Well, what are like, you you're talking about the rumors right here, all the different rumors. All this stuff. <laughs> what are, what are some heard? of the craziest <laughs> rumors that you've heard uh, through this? Other thing? than he, like, then two did the government did the government kill him? Have you heard that? Like, what are some <laughs> of, of the course, crazy rumors? There's that the one. Oh yeah, well that was a big potential theory written by a you know a, a, a self. You know, proclaimed journalist saying that, you know, because he was going to become so influential 
in the black party, his mom being a black panther and mm -hmm. all of this, that he's going to lead a revolution. And, you know, the government recognized that this guy's a future threat. We better eliminate him. So that was a theory that actually, <laughs> you know, was out there. But stuff was wild. I mean, um, it goes so far as to suggest that, like, Will Smith had something to do with it because uh. of Jada, who had a relationship with Tupac. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, stupid yeah. shit. You know, but those things, you know, were, have been thrown around there and, you know, uh, erroneously and and irresponsibly throwing, you know, yeah, well, you know, Will Smith had that done. Why? Because huh. Jada and Tupac's relationship. Like, come on. Yeah, right. Pop uh, tab two. Now, when you write your book, are you concerned at all? Because mm -mm. now you're coming out with details and everything else. No concern? No. Nah. No, not at all. Never I, worry about it. I saw Sean Combs had made a statement with Charlemagne. Oh, it's all fiction. It's this, it's that. Oh, so, okay. So you're suggesting maybe a legal concern about being sued for suggesting no, any of this. I um, just come after you. Yeah, no, I never thought in those terms. Um, I've received, like, online threats and just bullshit, you know, bullshit yeah. stuff. But, uh, no, no. Um, when, when I published the book, the original publisher that had bought the rights to the book was Random House. When they found out what was going to be in the book, when we delivered the original manuscript and they saw that we were throwing some shade on Puffy, they backed out. They said, hey, we're going to renege on our deal. Wow. We're not going to publish this. He's very litigious. We don't want to deal with that. It's a New York publishing house. Just coincidentally, <laughs> their offices are across the street from where Combs is where. And they're like, we just don't want to. You know, what we would spend in defending ourselves is probably going to make, you know, cost us more than what we'd ever make on the book. So they reneged on the contract. And so that's why I self-published it. Fuck it. Fuck mm -hmm. it. Got to put the truth in, right? Or what's the point? Yeah, exactly. Wow. <clears throat> Go to uh, tab four. And then this pops up to whatever else you were doing went out the window. And, <laughs> and now you're back in the mix. So now they raid Keefe's wife's house, right? Well, he lived there also. But he wasn't there when they, they went in. No, he was there. Oh, uh, I thought he wasn't there. I yeah. Either, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he we... comes out at gunpoint and, you know, um, they take him, detain him while they're searching the house. But, yeah. If you scroll down, I think there's like a little video. It was like the SWAT. Everybody's there. Play yeah. That. It was like a... TMZ. Now, where are you at when this has happened? Are you there? Oh, no. Oh. No, this is all Las Vegas Metro doing this um, probably. As covertly, they're obviously doing an early morning raid. Dude. It's all the tactical units pulling up. They're going to try to catch him off guard and see what happens next. He comes out peacefully. They do their search. They seize a bunch of things that they think could potentially have some relevance to the investigation. And now we just know that there's a grand jury going on and potentially going to indict him and finally hold somebody responsible. Somebody, right? Somebody's the last man standing. I did see somewhere when I was reading through it that I it could be bullshit, that they found bullets that might be from the gun that shot Tupac. No truth, just some no. news article headline. Yeah, yeah. But they had magazines, papers. Read some of this, Rob. This is the other article. It says, yeah. Keefe D facing imminent charges in Tupac murder after bragging about shooting. Yeah. Dwayne Keith, Keefe D. Davis is facing imminent charges concerning Tupac's murder. The Sun reports Keefe confessed to assisting in shooting the West Coast icon during an interview with Vlad TV. Mm -hmm. And law enforcement has built a case ready to present to the Las Vegas grand jury. Authorities stated that they're looking at first-degree murder potentially for Keefe D. The grand jury hearing will take place in private with the jury deciding whether or not the evidence found against Keefe is sound enough to prosecute the man in September 2023. Now, will they call you in for, for that? Probably not because, again, all of the confession he made to me in 2009, not to me, but to our task force with my – I was present – when we are doing our um, interrogation of him, none of that can be used. It's still, the proffer agreement still um, stands. But everything he did personally outside of that is what is going to be 
used against him, his own, you know, incriminating statements. So I don't have any involvement in that. What he had to say, he had to say, and um, that'll be, you know, used to indict him. But they'll build their case circumstantially also because, you know, it's going to be really interesting, Tommy, because this is going to be a unique thing in the justice system where your defendant is also the only witness against himself. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's a really interesting thing because he would take the stand and likely plead the fifth. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to self-incriminate on the stand. I'll plead the fifth. But then they can go and take all, everything that the, he said publicly and utilize that as what we call impeachment material. Mm -hmm. And so they would introduce all of these statements and then a jury or a judge would have to decide, do I believe all of those things, those claims he made? And so law enforcement will try to shore up all of that circumstantially and through other testimony to show that, yeah, it's very consistent with all the known facts. This is a legitimate confession of a solicitation for murder, and that's why he should be held accountable. So it seems like it would be a really clean and quick trial because who do you call to the stand? It's all about what he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they'll take all these podcasts that he went on, mm -hmm. Blab, his book, then take yeah. the facts that are known, mm -hmm. put them together, yep. and, then, and then the book. Ugh, I don't, I don't yeah. know how you get out of that one because the what the guy said is what he told you guys, and that matches. So even if the proffer mm -hmm. can't be used, obviously, well, in most proffers they can't, but if yeah. it violates it. He already said it anyway. He said and then it. he went on fucking Vlad TV yeah, of all idiot. places to go. I've, I've heard that's not the place to go for guys like yeah. that. It all started out. He was on, he got interviewed by a, uh, um, a docu-series on BET called Death Row Chronicles. Mm -hmm. That was the first time he publicly admitted to his involvement in the murder. And then he writes a book, <laughs> Street Legend. And then he goes on these podcasts, Vlad and, and others. And he just continually speaks as if he's got immunity. Because I think he thought he did. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, he figures, uh, you know, everybody else is dead. I'm the only one. Yeah, what are they going to do? And I'm going to be a celebrity. I'm a star. I mean, I'm the guy now. Tupac's dead. Biggie's dead. Everybody's uh, dead. But yeah, Crazy. But it, that's just that blab in his mouth. Just, well, you know, just staying well, the same. We'll find out sooner or later. Well, he's done. He's Talk, done for. Yeah. He, yeah I would it, think. I'm surprised the indictment hasn't already come down. I suspect that... As they're bringing people in to testify before the grand jury, they're just locking all of these potential witnesses into their testimony so that time comes for trial. If they're not around, they can use those grand jury statements and introduce those into trial. So what do so he goes and does an interview, says A, B, C, D, E. But what is it that he did that put it to the point where they can go raid him and they can go search him. What was it that he did where they can get that authority to go do that? So a, a search warrant's just built on probable cause, which is very a, a, a low standard of proof. So there's a, you know enough of an indication to suggest that he's likely involved. And so he's made all these public declarations. Hmm. There may be things going on surreptitiously in law enforcement to further gather information. I honestly don't know if there's, you know, different types of electronic surveillance going on or informants or anything else that might be actively working towards trying to bring this case um, to justice. But just his public declarations is enough to get a probable cause warrant. So they get their warrant, they go there, they seize property, they're going to take computers, phones, find out anything in there that would indicate his, uh, uh, his guilt. Mm -hmm. And he had magazines, he had covers, the thing, he had all kinds of shit. Yeah. Like, like, I would have burnt that the second I walked out of that proffer. I, man, I would have taken the $10 I had and went to Dominican Republic. <laughs> You'll never see me again. <laughs> I, I truly think that he's so naive about the about the, the process that when he yeah. came into a proffer, he thought that covered anything and everything into the future. Didn't realizing it was only applicable to that point in time our conversation in that moment yeah you can say whatever you want can't be used against you but once you leave the room and start bragging about it to others everything's that's it's done for it's done for 
then you go to the Biggie case, which you initially were working on, and then <clears throat> the Tupac just had overlapped it, correct? Yeah, the Biggie case is what led us into, because Keefe D, we also thought potentially was one of the per persons of interest in, in Biggie's case, because he was at the Peterson Auto Museum that night, and he actually had gone and talked to Puffy, and he talked to to Biggie so we knew he was there and so he may know something or possibly his crew could have been involved um, because of some type of outstanding debt because his crew had been doing security work for Bad Boy Records already and there was a suggestion that they had actually killed um, Tupac at the behest of Bad Boy and that they, they were there to collect a debt they weren't paid and so they summoned it up by killing. So that was one of our theories that we worked with. And when we met with him, and we're like, we want to know what you know about Biggie's death. He's like, I don't know anything about that. That's You guys need to look at Shook. That's hmm. it, that, Remember, the chronology here is like right. Tupac was shot and then Biggie. Right. Who would have the motive to shoot Biggie after Tupac? Shook. Right. But why would, why would Sean Combs allow, and I, I know I asked you this last time, so I, I apologize to repeat, but again, why in the world would you have your best guy go to California at that time unless you want him taken out? Because from the outside, you look at it. Who mm. was Sean Combs when Biggie was around? He was just, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> uh -huh. uh huh Then Biggie goes, he does a song with Faith, and now he's, you know, I don't know if he's worth a billion or not, Probably but he's cool. close. Yeah. Now, Biggie's alive. He never is that big face or whatever else. I, so I, from the outside, you look at it and you say, well... Yeah, mm -hmm. Tommy, I don't know I that... I just really don't like him. <laughs> yeah, maybe that, that's probably it. Because he wasn't a nobody. Like, yeah. he had already established himself. And um, and he was he was on the rise, and he could see his future and the potential that he had. And you know, he wasn't a nobody. He was significant. He was a rival of Suge Knight at Death Row Records. So um, for him to feel comfortable enough to say, "I can send my my you know my money earning artist out there," Tupac's dead. Suge's in jail. It's been six months. It seems like the coast is clear, right? There's no longer, you're not in enemy territory anymore. And if you're an East Coast guy and you want to expand your horizons, you got to make things happen in L.A. Right. So that's his whole thing. We got to go out L.A. and kind of put all this stuff behind us, open up new markets. Maybe we have a bad boys west, which was the plan. Right. And so, you know, he's just thinking we've got to expand. And it's safe to do because Suge's now in jail and uh, he's going to be there a long time. Tupac's dead. I have a, a crew of guys that I think are my buddies, are my buddies who yeah. have their thumbs on the pulse of what's happening in L.A. He had a false sense of security. And, and that that security guard, I forget his name. Remember him? He kept coming out trying. Maybe he was just trying to get attention. But tall guy, I, I believe you in terror talk to him i forget his name but he was he was there that the day biggie got killed mm -hmm. and he was the one who went on all the shows and said that yeah uh sean combs went out to the car he was supposed to get in that car acted like he forgot something went back in biggie wanted to go find these girls so he went and then sean went behind them and then biggie's killed yeah so he's i would put him in to the category of like cuckoo uh, he's a conspiracy theorist whose story changes all the time in order to fit whatever current narrative he wants to tell um he's he's he doesn't have any credibility he was there he did witness some things but none of it was relevant to the actual murder he didn't see who shot biggie um he's changed his story about what is you know is what he said at the time the truth? Is what he's saying now the truth? It's this ever, you know, always changing story. And so I just, he's hes just a guy, in, to your point, who's looking for attention. He's looking for clicks. He's looking for relevance. And if the truth is that he didn't really see or know anything, he's irrelevant. And that's something that he's just not going to accept. So as of today, what do we know with Biggie? And how, how's his mom done? I, his mom... Fault left yeah. him. Last time I checked, she just would not give up that woman. 
I think she still hopes that somehow somebody will be held accountable. Um, but I think she's also accepting the fact that it's unlikely at this point. Uh, my old partner, Darren Dupree, still maintains contact with her. He speaks with um, her grandson, oh, good. Chris Jr. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Biggie's kid has a good relationship with him. And so he, you know, Darren keeps him, everybody up to breast. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, up to, um, you know, keep them abreast of what's going on. But nothing's happening because we already know what happened and everyone's dead. Mm. So what happened, just to fill everybody, what happened with Biggie? I mean, even though you can't put it on paper and put mm -hmm. the dot and check it off, what happened with Biggie? Relatively simple. So, you know, Tupac gets killed. Biggie, I'm sorry, uh, Suge goes to jail. Um, Suge is obviously, he's in L.A. County Jail. He's aware of the fact that the bad boys are coming to town and celebrating and going to different venues and appearing at award shows. And so that they're in his backyard now, and he hasn't answered for what happened in Vegas. And, you know, he needs to do that. And so he, through an intermediary, this friend, his girlfriend, who also has one of his children, um, he gets her to come into the jail. And this is by her confession. She tells this story. He summoned me to the jail. He knew that because I was acting as a legal aide with his attorney, David Kenner, I could have non-monitored visits with, with Suge where we could have discussions without worrying about mm -hmm. Pioneer's hearing. And he tells me, hey, we're going to retaliate. I want you to get a hold of this gang member named Poochie who had a relationship with Suge. And Suge knew that this was the kind of guy that you could go to for this kind of work go find out what he wants ask him to take care of this problem she does she meets with poochie she makes an offer of money they have an exchange of money and next thing you know um you know biggie's leaving the auditorium and a green impala drives by and shoots and kills biggie and so we can connect poochie through the car through the girl through his own history and background and his relationship with suge so he's the most likely killer and then he ends up, much like Orlando Anderson, gets killed <laughs> in 2002, an unrelated Fucking guy. Christ. He's Jesus. riding his motorcycle. He gets shot 10 times in the back with an automatic but, rifle. You, what? You know what's funny, though? Like, and, and <laughs> I, I know the conspiracy theories. I get it. Like, It must be hard for you to always hear them. But like, sometimes you're, I, I sit here and I'm like, dude, like, you can't make this up. Like, This guy, the one we're assuming they killed mm -hmm. he's dead and you're thinking in the back of your head like all right who had him killed right. is it dr dre is it you know you're going yeah. through your list somebody bigger you know so you can see how these things yeah. like spiral then and yeah because i'm thinking in my head like what the I, I want to say greg are you sure yeah. but i mean he's the I, guy i know i think one of the things that helps is that if you had a, a, a an appreciation for what it means to be a an active gang member in los angeles mm -hmm. In within these crews, I mean, all kinds of guys around the death row um, entourage were dying. Most of them ended up killed and it had nothing to do with Tupac or Biggie. It's just part of being an active gang member when you're in a conflict. The Crips are shooting them. They're shooting Crips. People are just dying. You know, the uh, mortality of a gang member in Los Angeles is pretty short. So these, you know, the one guy who shot and killed Biggie. You know, he doesn't die for five more years. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, if it's really one of those right. things where we've got to silence this guy because he knows too much and he could talk, well, you're not going to wait five no, years. you're getting that done yeah. right after. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Within a week, he's yeah. gone, right? Damn. Yeah. That's a shame. Yeah, but that's, it's just, you know. So you think that one, you'll never be able to put a rubber stamp on that? No, not really. Um, there's three people involved in the conspiracy, the shooter who ends up getting killed, the female who confesses to her role in the whole thing, who we actually did give immunity to. Oh, I didn't know. So that. she's unprosecutable because we gave her immunity to to come clean. And then Suge, who's already doing, you know, essentially a life in prison for an unrelated murder. <laughs> this guy, everybody's away for it. He ran over somebody like a it, moron. Yep. Jeez. He ran over Terry Carter and killed him. <laughs> and then it, even if you <laughs> did use the girl as a. If, if, if she's your star witness to talk about the conspiracy to kill Biggie and she's going to testify against Suge Knight who solicits the murder, now you've got this thing where, okay, a baby mama is testifying against, you know, 
the father of her child, who she already has issues with because he doesn't play alimony. So is that really what's motivating her? Because he's not paying out. Right. You could discredit her quick. Totally. Yeah. And she has like six different California IDs. Jesus. So every time she goes to get (laughs) a different, you know, a, a new ID, she signs under penalty of perjury that this is the only time I've ever applied for a license under this name. So now you have a history of perjury, and that's going to be your star witness? Right. She's so discredited right off the bat. Done. Done for. Done for. That's a shame for his mom. It really is. And and, uh, Tupac's mom passed, right? Yeah, years ago. A case that just never ends that you got yourself into. Yeah, it's 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 the story that will never end, but I do hope that Las Vegas finally accomplishes what they've set out to accomplish, hold somebody responsible and get closure in that case for historical mm-hmm. value. Mm-hmm. It's like it's not an unsolved murder. We don't need to see that every year on the cover of People magazine, the 10 unsolved mysteries. It doesn't need to belong it doesn't belong there. Either does Biggie. Right. You know, these aren't unsolved. They're unprosecuted. There's no mysteries. We know what happened. So maybe we just let those things rest instead of continuing to feed into. And trying to add more to it and add more to it. And then, you know, just because like Tupac's mom is dead and Biggie's dead and, you know, Biggie has kids. Uh, You know, when his, I'm sure his kid doesn't want to see his dad every year, you know unsolved right. you know and people that love tupac and so on but yeah they'll run with it because everybody just wants money and attention and everything else also i think that there's just a, a kind of a societal conscience that these guys were bigger than life mm-hmm. right they're icons especially tupac but biggie too you know they're just bigger than life and their their lives are cut short in the prime of their lives when they're in their early 20s and it just doesn't equate for us to think that their lives were so easily snuffed out by these meaningless under individuals, mm-hmm. you know, just these gangsters took away from the world, people with so much potential. And, and it almost like with Tupac, with Tupac, you know, he was stuck in jail. There comes Shug getting them out. Mm-hmm. You know, nothing was really in his name. We went through that before, <laughs> kind mm-hmm. of bucking him. Always kind of looking for that father figure, that big yeah. brother. But, you know, with Tupac and those lyrics and he was starting to act, I just, you know, you always wonder, what would what would things be like if those two guys were around? Oh, my God. Because yeah. these guys yeah. wouldn't be around. <laughs> the shit we're hearing now. Yeah. But, it, but it's funny because, like, my I got a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, and they love Tupac and Biggie. And they're 16 and 13. I mean, I grew up, I was in high school or junior high listening to Biggie and Tupac and it's amazing how they've just continued this legacy yeah. gone I mean it's sad but it's continued I mean it's still going it's amazing every hip hop artist every rap artist in the world yeah. today pays homage those were those yeah. guys you know set the standard and they have I don't think they've ever been overshadowed um, so they're, they're so relevant and significant in with within at least the music industry um, but po- you know, Tupac had so much tremendous potential as a representative of the black community. Mm-hmm. You know, what, and from what I understand, Colin Powell actually has, what was reaching out to Tupac, and I maybe mentioned this yeah. last time, you know, to help him do urban development type of things, to use his influence in a positive way you know, for the black community. And who knows where he'd be? Maybe it'd be Senator Shakur. Really? Like, who he, knows? He, I really think he could have been. I mean, yeah. the guy was smart ahead of his time, mm-hmm. but he just got with the wrong... You so know, charismatic. So charismatic, but, you know, there was something missing, and then he was attracted to that mm-hmm. life, and that ended it all. Yeah. You know? His death by association. Death by association, yeah. 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 That's a shame. Both of them, too. Yeah. Like, Biggie wasn't trying to and you're, fight anybody. Biggie is just a big old teddy bear. Yeah, he's just a big old teddy you're bear. A, you're, a, you're a Tupac guy. Though. You like uh, Tupac. Yeah, yeah. Like, when I was growing up, I was mm. even though I was in Philly, I just, I like Tupac because the lyrics. Right. Because yeah. I would listen to what they say. Where Biggie, to me, was more of, I like Biggie. you go to a party, you listen to the melody. Yeah. But Tupac, I could listen to the whole album because I listened mm. to what he would say. Because yeah. his lyrics meant something. So, to me, I liked... 
Tupac lyrically, whereas the other, like Biggie, okay, you, you, I'm, I like it. I like it. I, I'm a word guy. I uh-huh. like to see how somebody thinks, you know. So I was really into Tupac, but now I just hear. What the fuck you say? Yeah, <laughs> with auto tune and all that. You know, back then there was no auto tune. There was no beat playing behind you with the words. They were just going out and rapping or singing. And now it's you wonder half the time if they're even doing anything and can you imagine the ability for it to sit down and write and just in in, in that become like yeah. in no time at all chicken scratching some lyrics and next thing you know you're putting them to beats and next thing you know like he was able like almost genius level yeah. of you know of, of, of a, of a yeah. musical a musical prodigy because what I understand is that when he came out from Rikers Island and started to fulfill his responsibility of providing some, you know, albums for Death Row yeah. in exchange for getting him out of jail, <laughs> like four hundred. Dude, songs. he's just like working. Like yeah. no one could keep up with him. Yeah, nobody could keep up with him. He's like, no, we need to be in the studio. We need to be producing music, and he just had so much to offer. It was nuts. I watched an hour and a half video, like behind the scenes, and I don't know where he was back. But he'd be like, get up, we got to get this done. Where are you going? And he would write it down. Mm-hmm. Come on, just give me the beat. And he'd be like, the beat ain't done. And Tupac would be like, give me any beat. Just give me a beat, I'll make it good. And, it, and he'd be like, now, I, done. Yeah. Five minutes, I want another beat. I'm smoking. That's how he was. He was yeah, nuts. Man, I, just, I just remember walking past my 13-year-old's room the one day, and all I hear is, I'm hearing him singing. I hear music. I'm like, wait a second. What is listening? I'm hearing, um, I hit him up. He's my thirteen year old singing. I'm like, what the hell? Turn that off right now. You're not supposed to be saying that. <laughs> man, what it like those those were some great lyrics. Great. Now what got you into cop life, investigative life? Canadian American. I missed that last time. I knew there was something I can't I couldn't pinpoint it, but now ah, Canadian. Okay. okay. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid. But as I got older, started working out, I had to watch out for sugar and empty carbs. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you'll love, but high protein and less sugar. The variety pack, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. This pack has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs. Only 140 calories per serving. It's high protein, zero grams of sugar, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. The fruity one, I'm done for. I can eat the whole box, no problem. Go to magicspoon.com slash MSCS to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use promo code MSCS at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. That says something. Remember... Get your next delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash MSCS and use the code MSCS to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped.com. The breaking news, Manscaped now sells beard products. That's right. They are once again revolutionizing men's grooming with brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. From a beard trim to a fresh shave, the technology behind Beard Hedger Pro Kit allows you to shave your signature beard look. Now you can finally use Manscaped products to make your drapes match your carpet by going to manscaped.com and using code MSCS Media for 20% off and free shipping. No one likes a weird beard, so say goodbye to all the stubble trouble with Manscaped's Pro Beard Kit. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. This thing is a monster of fixing faces. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard. No more messing around in drawers, this color one, that color one, all with one guard. Plus it's waterproof, so you can shave in the shower and avoid all that hair in the sink. The Pro Kit doesn't end there though. First, there's the beard shampoo and conditioner. You need to remember your hair is different. Next, Manscaped's beard oil. Tap it off with beard balm. The Pro Kit also comes with three different gifts, a beard brush, comb and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress so get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code mscs media at manscaped.com 
That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code MSCS Media. I couldn't pinpoint what I was missing, but now I know. You're not missing anything because there's no, I don't know where that came from. This is Canadian American everywhere on you. I don't know where that came from. Even on Wikipedia. Yeah, no, I was born in Reno, Nevada. Oh, wow. And, yeah, I've never, I've, I've been to Vancouver, Canada once when I was going on a cruise. I've never been to Canada. Type I don't in, know. Type in Greg We're Caden. starting the rumor it, now. You're from Canada. Yeah, type in Greg It's Caden. already there. If you look at Wikipedia, yeah. it says. Uh, Dude, just so from, you like, don't think I, I'm a nutcase. Yeah. 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 I wonder why the hell it says that. I, I thought no this idea. was supposed to be so legit, so perfectly fact-checked. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it, Toronto is where it says I'm like from Toronto, Canada. I don't have a clue. Is hey, look, Canadian American. Canadian American yeah. author and former Los Angeles Police Department. I mean, if it says it, it's got to be true. Yeah. Greg, sorry, Greg, you don't know. All right. I, well, I'm you're, Canadian. You're I just Canadian. don't know it. Yeah. Fuck you, Wikipedia. Uh, got, uh, evidently, all, all of a sudden, I love hockey. <laughs> Wikipedia, <laughs> yeah. can yeah, we I love please hockey update that? And, like Molson Golden or whatever oh, yeah. beer. And have. you're from Toronto. Yeah, it, there it is. Oh, yeah. you like the coal. Oh, there it is. Uh, wow, cool. Uh, what's Toronto like now? Um, come here. <laughs> 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 So what led you down to, to the right. cop career? Um, really, it's just um, at a period in my life, I was kind of aimless. But my best friend's dad was a cop. And he was also the football coach of my, my Pop Warner football team. And I was just kind of f trying to figure life out at, as a 20-year-old. And um, he, you know, I was kind of getting into some minor trouble. I got arrested for having like noon chucks oh, yeah. and, and, and weed or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just, he, yeah. So this, this guy was a squared away, uh, Lieutenant with the sheriff's department. He's my best friend's dad. He sees me hanging out with his kid. <laughs> He's like, I don't know if you're the best influence. Um, and you haven't gotten into so much trouble yet. They would disqualify you from the potential of a, a career. And he's like, before anything else happens, apply for the sheriff's department. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. So I did. <laughs> That's so good. So I just, oh, yeah. Man. So I ended up applying and, and somehow through his influence, um, got cleared of the background investigation. And next thing I know, I'm in the academy. And uh, that began the journey. Because it started placing it while you're working at the jail, then academy, mm -hmm. then homicide, and robbery, right? So I'm, I'm working, originally I went through the Orange County Sheriff's Academy, was a deputy sheriff, was working in the jail, and then I did a ride-along in Los Angeles because I'm, I'm a jail deputy. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually a law enforcement officer, but I'm, I'm not acting like a cop, I'm a jailer. And so I wanted to go on a ride-along to see what's, up, what's the streets like. And I did a ride-along in L.A., um, and I was like, holy smokes, this is where I want to work. This is an awesome environment. And so I applied for the LAPD. At the time, they are like, well, do you want to go through another academy? Because we require you to go through another academy. I'd just gone through one two years ago. <laughs> and I was like, hell yeah, I'll do it. I just want to work these streets. And so I went through the LAPD academy, and that began my journey and became wow. an investigator. And So what year do you start working the streets after the academy? The second time. So I graduate from the LAPD Academy in 88. 88. Yeah. And so, I, and then I get assigned to a, a division in South Central A. Uh, <laughs> South Central A. South, yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. Totally out of my element. I'm an Orange <laughs> County boy. Right. Yeah. And so it was amazing. It was such a great opportunity to learn and, and get um, kind of experienced. Um, Newton Division was the name of the police division I worked in. And that began, you know, I started to get into gangs. And yeah, narcotics. what was it like then? In, in 88, 90, what was that like? You go out, you got it, now you get out on the street. Tell us what's going on there. What, what do you invest? Tell us a couple of your first investigations or cool ones. So Newton Division's relatively small. It's in the heart of South Central L.A., and it's just infested with gangs and blood gangs Crip gangs, Hispanic gangs, and everything. I'm working in a complete minority environment. And so I'm learning like this, the streets. But because of my little, a little bit of a checkered background, I think that helped me to get a, a, a balance and a perspective that this is just an environment people are born into. And you have to kind of work with that as opposed to seeing it as something completely animus or, you know, um, so you just, 
I, I began to really become not uh, obsessed is too strong of a word, but I just became really enamored with gang culture. Like, what is the deal? And most of these young men that with horrible influences around them, there's oftentimes no father figure, and their family becomes the people on the streets more so than what's, you what's know, at, what home? at home. And I, it just began to, you know, be interesting to me. You know, how does this operate? And, and what is all this with the clothing and these gang signs and the monikers? And it just was really interesting. And that kind of blossomed into being a gang investigator. And then, of course, as a gang investigator, there's homicides everywhere. You know, we had... You know, this small division, one year, I th- we had 113 homicides within this four square miles. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so it was like just these are the heydays of the late 80s and early 90s where, man, there were just bodies littering the streets. And, and do you ever find who did it or you're just picking up the bodies? Gang investigations more likely and not go unsolved because of the culture of not talking, mm-hmm. right? So... You know, you would have these drive-by shootings, which was the way of committing murders back in the day, mostly were, walk- were drive-bys, occasionally walk-bys, but um, people don't talk. And the gangs were becoming more and more sophisticated in the sense that, like, if a crip gang was going to do a drive-by, um, they would yell out the name of a gang that uh, that misleads the police. Mm. So oh. a witness who would say, hey, they came by and, you know said you know five deuce or whatever well it wasn't it was like some other gang but you're tracking the five deuce exactly yeah. <clears throat> so they up. they were learning as they went how to become more undetected and more sophisticated and then guys started to even the dress you know became you know deflect make it look like the, some some bloods did this it was always red and blue though yeah, hmm. and then predominantly, what's the patrullo or something? I see a lot of rapper guys do that LA thing. They do something like this. I don't know. It's one of the gangs out there. Like a sign or something. Yeah, it's, there's probably seven thousand signs, so I don't know yeah. how to narrow yeah. it down. Every single gang has their own little. <clears throat> but now back then, you know, your coworkers worked with you. They helped you, mm-hmm. unlike <laughs> yeah. as the future would hold, if we recall. You know, you had half the fucking guys with the Tupac case were cops working with death row. Well, so there, again, you have to kind of unpack that. You had guys that were working with, like, Compton PD and and Inglewood PD. There was only one LAPD guy that was actually actively working with the security company that provided security for death row, which was called Right Way Security, which was founded by an ex-Compton cop named Reggie Wright. He was friends with Suge. They grew up in Compton together. They were aware. So when Com- when when Suge Knight and Death Row needed legitimate security, it made sense for Suge to go. I know a guy who's a cop. Maybe he can get guys to work security. And it's just blossomed. The guys started moonlighting. Right. Right. Yeah. But they're still cops. And so you're going to be a little bit, you know, you're you're cautious about how you behave around them. So the idea for Suge and and with Rightway Security is like they'll handle legitimate security. Street shit, I've got my gangsters. They'll handle the things that need to be handled on a street level. But the facade of having legitimate off-duty law enforcement guys... Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and maybe because I have criminal activity going on within my organization, the perception will be that, um, you know, if it's got to be, it's got to be clean because a bunch of cops work there. So it was just, it, you know, it was. It's a front. It's a front. Yeah, to make it look good to the public. Yeah. And they think full on you. Right. Right. If something happens, they think right. full on you. No, not those guys. But they were just too crazy. Yeah. So before you got the, the Biggie case, what was the biggest case prior to that? So that you had solved or got handed to you? I was knee deep in another big federal racketeering case of a guy named George Torres. Um, he was a, a, a self-made millionaire, um, an, an Hispanic immigrant who came up on the streets. He was, um, you know, he had a very, very limited education, like a fourth grade education, but built an empire. He was smart enough to realize that within the 
environment of South Central LA, he could provide services that other big corporate companies wouldn't want to do, like for supermarkets. Hmm. You know, the Ralphs and the Vaughns, they don't want to work in those environments because of the loss factors. And so he's, he opened up supermarkets. And ultimately, I, and I think he ended up with nine different supermarkets. Um, but he was like really, really genius in the sense that provided really high, just good quality stuff, super clean markets. Um, and he would send shuttle buses out into the community because he knew a lot of these immigrant people didn't have driver's licenses. And so the women needed to go shopping for their groceries. So he'd send shuttles out and they could just hop on the shuttle, go to the, you know, to the supermarket shop, and then they get dropped off. It was really smart. But he was also involved in a lot of other <laughs> criminal activity. <laughs> but. Yeah, but. <laughs> and so that's how we got involved in investigating him from a racketeering aspect. There were some murders that we believe he was responsible for, um, a lot of extortion, um, influence peddling or public corruption with city officials to get permits for parking lots. He's buying those off. And so this whole big, you know, array of different charges. And I was knee deep in, in that case when I got offered to work Biggie's case. Wow. And then when you got Biggie's case, what'd you think? Were you like, Oh fuck, here we go. Excited or oh, drama. I didn't, it, of course I, it was always welcome to the challenge investigatively. You're like, oh, this, this, it's unsolved. You know, what haven't they done or what could we now do in order to try to bring, you know, make progress in this case? Um, but I didn't know anything about the rap music industry. Nothing. I, I didn't understand, like, the, the, the culture. <laughs> that was fun. I understood the gang culture in the sense that... Blood, crypt, that and yeah, killings and... and any yeah. associations that these record labels might have with gang stuff I could do but in order to truly understand it I knew that I needed somebody who understood the music and they understood like uh, at a different level and that's why I went to one of my best friends a guy named Darren Dupree African-American investigator grew up with the music grew up in South Central LA worked the clubs where you know where where, where Suge would frequent he knew a lot of the guys and so he became my right arm man to provide me with more insight and so between the two of us, we gathered a, a pretty good understanding of how to approach the case. And how much time did you spend on those two cases combined? How, mu how much time would you say? Three, three solid years. <laughs> oh, shit. Wow. Yeah, three solid years. What's that paperwork look like? Well, we went into it with, there was already 70, t there was, yeah, there was <laughs> like boxes Stacks. and boxes and boxes i think there was 94 four inch binders oh my God. that was you know um so much investigative material because again it's 10 years after the fact and we had to figure out what's in these boxes what has been done what haven't we tried who's still around mm -hmm. you know and so we had to first of all get acquainted with the case itself and then try to figure out what to do that hadn't been done. What about the pressure? Because it was such a high profile case, did you feel a lot of pressure? Because I mean, your face is the face. Mm. It doesn't matter who else pops up. When it comes to Tupac and Biggie, it's Greg. So there was pressure, but at that time, not on not on me as a person, there was pressure on us as a task force, task force yeah. because of this pending lawsuit. So you've got this lawsuit against the city of LA yeah. That is uh, that is um, um, suggesting that LAPD was not only involved in the murder but involved in a big cover up. So you've got this whole big civil case looming, and now the department says, "Can you guys get to the heart of the matter? Is there any truth to this? It's unsolved. These allegations are incredible. Is there any truth to that?" So we set out to try to find out if there was, in fact, any truth to it. And as we went down the rabbit holes of the theory that led to that lawsuit, we began to f figure out pretty quickly that, no, this is just, this is a dive at deep pockets. This is some attorneys who have convinced Valletta Wallace that there's, you know, they're, 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 that there's fire behind the smoke. And, um, and she, unbeknownst, believes it. 
Right. I mean, as a mother that just lost her son, mm -hmm. you know, you take advantage of her. To, to me, that's just so fucking evil. <clears throat> but it's the world. It's attorneys. Attorneys. Oh, you know yeah. how this oh, operates. Yeah. It's like, well, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's can we get them to settle for a lot of money? Yeah. Can we create a situation where they'll just like, let's make it go away and we can get millions of dollars just to get, a, you know, that's the attorney mindset, at least in that case. When nothing gets done, mm -hmm. she gets paid. She's not going to be happy. She wants answers. Right. You know, exactly. Especially her. You know? Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that's just the whole mess of it. I, and, I think that she believed there was some truth behind the theory. So I do believe that her motives were to get to the truth of it all. With the attorneys, not so much. They had enough inside information to know that this is this is a baseless theory. Yeah, like for a guy like me or Rob, you hear all these stories, and in your mind, it just seems too simple that there was a fight. He goes out, pops Tupac, and then Shug gets pissed, hires one guy, two guys, whatever. He gets popped, and that's what happened. It just seems too simple. So there's not enough drama with it. And the only right? reason that 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 you, that you think that way is because of the names Piggy and Tupac, right. because they're celebrity. Right. Right. Now, had this taken place, and these aren't guys that are are well known, it's the exact same thing. This is just how the gangs operated. This is tit for tat, retaliation. Fuck you. You 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 hit me. I'm going to shoot you. This was that's just the street culture. Right. So you have to take away Tupac, Biggie, yeah, Suge Knight, P. Diddy, and you have to say, if Tommy went up and punched a crip, the head of a crip or somebody high up, mm -hmm. or pistol whipped them, they're definitely coming after me. And, and if I'm a blood hmm. and they take care of me, now yeah, by the street, right. I have to do something or I'm weak and now my street cred's gone for the bloods, blah, blah, so I have to. Right. And it's not just that an incident happened there's this long history of conflict so it's not that some guy just ran up and hit tommy it's that there's already been problems with tommy's family and these people right and now a blood hits a crypt right that's mm -hmm. what you're pretty much saying a blood yeah. is not only just uh it's not tommy a it's a tommy who's our yeah. you know the other team yeah that hits him so right. now you're really done for yeah and then of course somebody's going to retaliate from the other Right. When you say it like that, it makes sense, right? You take the names away, it's simple. What, what's I the, I guess, the temperature, the atmosphere out there right now? I mean, I know you're not in the in anymore, but like with, with gangs, is it still as bad as it was back then? Has it calmed down? I'm sure there's still murders that happen every day. Yeah. But has it calmed down from what you know or hear about? Um, has like technology helped with that? Meaning cameras everywhere, yeah. right? So now it's hard to get away with the shit that they got away with then. Right. Totally, yeah. The whole, the, the whole culture of gangs has evolved. Yeah, you know, it used to be you just knew they were bloods because they're standing on a street corner with a red rag in their pocket. Right, right. Or they're, you know, they've got their pee hat on for pyro, whatever. So they've Pyre. found out that like it's not in our best interest to self advertise that we're involved in criminal activity. So yeah. it it evolves, and then they became more um, sophisticated and how to conduct themselves into a more white collar type of stuff. Obviously the narcotics is still a big component of it all, but they figured out how to not be their own worst enemies. And so they've evolved in that sense. And to your, to your point, Rob, is that technology, you know, you've got, everybody's on social media that didn't exist. So you can see all kinds of communications going on today that you wouldn't have been able to see back then because people are stupid enough to put their right. it's like Keefy D being out there just putting on blast I'm a murderer and so I those see things I see it and, every day and I just think to myself you're crazy yeah it's just a matter of time pal uh, and then you've got t cell phone technology basically you're always tracking yourself right so all of these things really help to help law enforcement as far as managing their investigations and exposing criminal activity you know where back then it it was a little bit more difficult to technology wasn't always working in our favor but now it seems like you guys got your hands tied especially like la new york chicago what do you do if you do something and you go home you don't know what's going to happen when you wake up the next the next day you're a racist the next day you're on trial for killing somebody who was trying to shoot you but you're the one who's on trial yeah you know what do you do as an officer or an agent nowadays i don't 
I can't answer that because I can't put myself into real time what it would be like today, but I can tell you what a lot of guys are doing, which is just um, taking the path of least resistance. Yeah. The less we do, the less likely anybody's going to second guess us. Isn't that crazy? It's horrible. Yeah, there was just, if you saw yesterday in Philly, down on uh, Walnut Street, oh, Walnut they Street? broke into Lululemon and Jeez. Foot Locker. They ransacked yeah. it. And Austin, you know Walnut Street. So they all ran in there, a bunch of people came out with you know all bags and shit of everything and so the cops got called the alarms went off cops come there's probably maybe about 10 or 15 philly police officers now there's about 80 people so they tried to call back up so one officer tackled whoever coming out just got somebody tackled him and somebody's recording it on their cell phone and so the cop punches the guy because he's robbing the place he punches him takes him to the ground well, now today I just saw something where there people are demanding that the officer offer an apology because he punched the man in the face. <laughs> I, I was just like, where have we gotten to? Where have we gotten? Sir, kindly stop in the name yes, of the please, law. Yes, please. Here, give me that bag. You'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah, well, he's got a forty-five in his pocket and a <laughs> knife. Could you please give me that bag on your way out? Yes. Unreal. But yeah. And we had, uh, I always mess up her first name. Yaomi Ye Yaomi Park. Park She's a, a North Korean defector <clears throat> She's in New York Some drug dealer offer, Offers her son a lollipop And it had fentanyl in it oh. She goes to the cop And goes do you see this And the cop's like he doesn't want to I'm staying out of it That's how crazy Yeah it's We're all going to suffer the consequences Of a An um, an inefficient law enforcement system. Now, what do you think of the whistleblowers? Like, just like the UFO thing. All of a sudden, now there's UFOs. I love this time. Right? Now we're getting the UFOs. <laughs> so Great. tell me what you think about this. Because, you, you know, you've worked with the, these people. Wait, wait. When you say I've worked with these okay, people, you've worked, you you've about? worked. Okay. You've worked around the feds, mm -hmm. law enforcement, so on and so forth. So when you see a, a whistleblower out of nowhere, all of a sudden there's fucking aliens and UFOs and that's where Tupac went on the UFO. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah, he's not oh, dead. oh, oh, that's right. Dead. The one that went 15 million light years yeah, and Greg, got here, Greg, sorry, and it crashed. Greg, he's actually not dead. Uh, he got uh -huh. abducted by aliens. That was a false body of Tupac. So sorry. What planet sorry is he on right now? Um, you know. I don't know. Yeah, Nubia. Uh, Nubia. N Nabia. Nabia. Uh, what, whatever the planet yeah. is. That's Tupacalypse. Tupacalypse, yeah. maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry to break it to you. But... Uh, well, <laughs> I guess I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your take on that? On what's UFOs? your take on this? UFO well, just not necessarily the UFOs, but the fact that now all of a sudden you have a line to report to. You have whistleblowers coming out saying that there's bodies and crafts, but no one ever has anything. No one ever has a piece of anything, mm -mm. but everything else in this world, somebody has something, even if it's a speck. But there was one in Brazil, there was one here, but there, nobody has anything but stories. Yeah. What do you think's going on with this? Oh, interesting conversation. I, I, uh, sometimes I think it's all part of a huge distraction. That, you know, that it's intentional to create deflect distractions from real world problems. Mm -hmm. So now we're just paying attention to this because it's fascinating conspiracy theories. And they know that that, you know, inherently it's going to create differing opinions and that causes even more attention to come to it. So like my best friend, Mike, he's he's a Roswell 51 believer Mm -hmm. Like there's aliens, they've landed here, they've crashed, we have evidence. And I am a little bit more reluctant to believe any of this. I need to see that and touch it and see true evidence. Um, but, but herein lies the point. It's like me and him, we would never have had this conversation until now. Right. And now all of a sudden we're like having arguments over it. Right. You're not talking about what bathroom you're going to go into, how fucked up that is, or how yeah. 70 million people are coming through the border with drugs and terrorists. Yep. Like terrorists just, mm -hmm. what, they go to sleep? And it's just people walking by? Who's the real illegal immigrants? <laughs> it's the aliens. <laughs> yeah. They're uninvited. Yeah. They're... But for, yeah, forget about everything that's going on. Let's just talk <laughs> about the UFOs coming down. Want to go out tonight? Maybe we'll see one, you know? Yeah. That's how I am, too. Like, it, just a big deflect. Because it was too sudden. Yeah. Bang. 
What the hell? All of a sudden, it became like legitimized. Like five years, a couple of years ago. You're a tin hat. You're a tin hat. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, and it's like, whoa, this is actually maybe happening. Out of nowhere. And then Mexico comes out with those Indian oh, bodies. Fake, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I was like, well, now if this is something, all right, now you got mm -hmm. me. Then they do the DNA and they're like, no. Nah. like E.T. I'm like, there's yeah. no way they're like, no, like nah, E.T. No, nah. <laughs> nice try. They're, they were like, nice try. And they and then they suppressed the hell out of it, you know. <laughs> but it's, it has, so you think distraction. Yeah, I do. I think it's all part of a big distraction. Well, I think there's people out there that obviously believe this all to be true and they find their own reasons to substantiate, you know, the evidence of it. But as a whole, I think that it's all part of a big distraction. Me too. You know, you get these guys and they want to believe it. Mm -hmm. So then somebody says in Brazil there's a crash, they make a documentary, and I truly think that they do believe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they believe it because they want to believe it so bad that mm -hmm. they pull at hairs. And it could have been an asteroid. It could have been yeah. anything. But this is what it is in the documentary, and we got proof. And then then those guys that want to believe it's so bad, then you have Senate hearings on this, and they're – they're over there like finally it's true it's here totally you know? yeah and then you, you you know you find somebody with some surface credentials oh he was he was with nasa oh he's an f-16 pilot and they saw things and so now like there's credibility Crazy. because of the you know of the credibility of the person who's providing the information so it's i don't know it's interesting but you have a 200 million dollar aircraft and that's the best video you can get to me well, more Satellites. so. <laughs> like, like the more practical question is, if you figured out how to break the dimensions of time for space travel, right? Because you're millions of light years away. Right. So you figured out how to bend trans time, you bend time yeah. or, you know, so it, but yet you, you fucking crash. That's what I always say. It's like, wait a minute, you don't have the technology to figure out how not to hit this planet, but you can somehow subvert space? Right, that, that's what I yeah, always say. I, I say, if you can bend time, if you figured out how to bend time and travel 20, mm -hmm. 30, who knows how far, million light years, what, you're going to make it all the way here and you're going to crash? They didn't crash. Their spacecraft is on the bottom of the ocean floor and they come up through the ocean. That's what I believe. Uh, that could be that. that I I, now that now we that I don't. Got down they're they're like the in the ocean. Mariana's Trench, or they're somewhere, somewhere down in the well, yeah, the, uh, the Bermuda Triangle. That's my. That's so my we had. Uh, I love it. We had Daryl. <laughs> there we had Daryl Miklos on. Who? Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, this is this is a good. One. So this guy Cooper, he was the first guy to go to space on the Mercury uh, ship. Thing, ship. Okay? okay, so when he's up there. He was into shipwrecks, so he had pinpointed from space 55 spots that he thought uh, shipwrecks were. Okay. This guy, Michelos, he was very close with his father. He went from NASA to the intelligence agent, like the Area 51 shit, 4, 5, S5, however many they have. He worked with them. He had told this guy, Cooper, a lot. And if you would talk to this Cooper, you would, I'm positive, if you talk to him, you would know he's not lying. Okay. Like no body movement, no moving of eye contacts. Gordon Cooper. Gordon Cooper. Uh, and Miklos, who was talking about it like a nonchalant. Yeah. And I kept trying to drill him to see what else this Cooper told him. And he had said, look, you know, Cooper isn't here. He's passed away. So without him being here, I don't want to say too much because I don't have him here to, you know, say it in his own way. Okay. Little small things make me believe him. And he said that the Cooper had told him that one thing that was pretty cool was that the digital camera was already developed, done, ready to go. And his father went to Kodak and it was done in the 1960s. The 60s it was done. Yeah. And then Cooper told him that the aliens are among us in the water. And there's, vet, there's all those places out like in Antarctica and over there and tons of areas of water that we just can't get to. Now, so what are they doing here? Like, what 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 do they have to gain from such a archaic, um, you know, what do they have to gain from us? I mean, that's the, that 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 would be a wild. Why guess. would you stick around here? Unless <laughs> unless we're like their experiment, you could go down that rabbit hole. You, you know, you could say that 
they're throwing stuff here to make technology go from a cell phone or a car phone to all this stuff. I don't know, observing. I don't know. I mean, if it's like us going, you know, back 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 years and looking at these idiots just try to blow themselves up or destroy themselves. I don't know. Yeah, see, that's where it just becomes a disconnect for me. If you're a very advanced species, what do they have to gain by watching us? You know, it's like, you know, you and I go into a kindergarten playground to try to find wisdom. Like, what are we going to get? We're going to observe kids, and they're not going to really tell us anything that we don't already know, right? We've already figured out human behavior. It doesn't take a lot to realize. It's like, I don't get, like, it's not the resources here because you've already traveled here from, right? you know, galaxies away. I just don't understand the logic of why. why and why wouldn't you expose yourself? What do you have to gain by maintaining your anonymity uh, at the bottom of the ocean so th the answer to that in my opinion would be you know like we're trying to go to mars for a secondary planet mm -hmm. how if that math that donald hoffman i've regurgitated this a hundred thousand times so it doesn't okay. matter the math that <clears throat> hoffman came up with you know that there's the one how if the one is another planet that wanted to put life here as a secondary planet like we're trying to do with Mars, then you could kind of make some type of sense out of that. So if they're from another planet and they want to, you know, make another planet with life, then that would be a reason why they would be here as a secondary planet or something like that. Other than that, I don't know why you would come see a bunch of monkeys run around and try to kill each other. Yeah, exactly. Because you know? and, and <laughs> we definitely went the wrong path. We're not building pyramids. We're not uh, within self or nature. It's all who has what and who's who. The new iPhone 15 came out. I think it's cameras a little better, they said this time. So, oh, yeah. another 1500 for the exact yeah. same phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the aliens didn't come down, I guess. And give them the, <laughs> they didn't give them the fucking chip, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's fanciful, fanciful thinking. And, I mean, you can get into, like, a lot of complexities that raise questions. But I think what's important is just, like, if the most basic questions can't be answered – then the complex ones, I think, become a little bit more evasive. And it's like, what the fuck would you want to do? <laughs> Have If you're going to take over, you'd have done it. There's nothing to really see here, right? Because what we do now is no different than what we did 2,000 years ago. You're not learning anything from our culture. We just repeat the same shit over and over and over. You don't need the technology, right? There's nothing we're going to learn from our technological advances because you've already figured out how to bend time. Yeah. So really, what's... And then I'm like you, and I go this, back... To, this is, at best, a, a freaking rest stop on the highway. You best. might come and piss. I'm with you. But then get it, move on. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I go back and forth because I lean because I want it to be. Mm -hmm. But then when I come back to rationality, every other thing, think of one thing big that somebody didn't run their mouth with. They didn't show off something that they have. Right. If somebody had a piece of a right. fucking spaceship from another planet. Right. You're telling me in the world, all these years, yeah. nobody has anything. No one has you anything. got some dumb picture. You got some black and white thing. Not one thing. Yeah, a lot of manipulated information. Yeah. So, so right there for me. But it's working because here we are having yeah, this conversation. conversation. You're right. It's, it is. it's working, whatever the, the the motive is behind it, you know, behind the, the facade. Well, the agenda, the, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're professionals. ET2. That's what it's setting up to. ET2, hopefully. <laughs> Let's hope. Where do you stand with drugs? What, what do you think they should do with drugs? You know, like Portugal, mm -hmm. they pretty much have everything legal. And right. their drug, their crime and everything went down big time. If, if you have... If you're addicted to alcohol, cocaine, uh, a couple other things, you go, you know, they pay their insurance and their medical. So they're not doing this whole rehab thing that's right. bullshit, you know, charge bill 50 grand and then go to outpatient and then go do all this. In Portugal, you go in, they give you NAD for 30 days in Librium and send you on your way. It's the cheapest way for them because they're paying for it. And if you get caught with, say, like a kilo of Coke, you go in, you have to go to classes, you have not American type class. You have to uh, go to real shit, get a uh, job, so on and their crimes going down, their uh, you know, the rate the percentage of people addictive has gone down. 
initially when they did it, it went up, but now it's going way down from what it was. Okay. Where do you stand with that? What do you think they should do with the drug laws? Because I'm certain, and I could prove it, mm -hmm. that the government is involved with the drugs coming in. Right. Because it's very odd that, I don't know, where Clinton is, it seems to be more expensive to drop off drugs. Where Bush is, it seems to be more expensive. Mm. It's it's a real I don't know it's very I think this becomes a really complicated conversation. And then Greg also every guy that we've had in that has brought massive amounts of drugs into <clears throat> the USA, mm -hmm. it's all different into the USA which I'm sure you already know. But everything that comes here isn't what goes to other countries. They make everything that kill comes us. here way more addictive, kill us this that the other. Now, if you have it legalized and you can regulate it, if there's no fentanyl in it, this still doesn't take away the street dealer. Would it work here? I mean, what, what's your feelings on that? I think that the war on drugs as a whole has failed miserably. Um, I mean, you can just to put this into context. You know, when I was growing up and, and in the 80s, um, you, you know, you, it's a felony to possess pot and here and now, you know, you can just buy it. It's recreational. It's considered a harmless drug, right? But yet it's still federally a one, it's still right? federally. Yeah. So it's, does that, it, does that blow your mind as a, yeah, it does because, but it's, it's like a lot of things. A lot of these laws that exist still don't get enforced. I mean, really the feds aren't out there trying to bust, you know, marijuana deals <laughs> i would hope not. Yeah. yeah so you know it's just one of those things that they just haven't taken off the books they're watching the states are making their own progress with this thing and and i think that everything has to be looked at on an individual basis you know marijuana essentially is harmless and i think it's a good alternative to alcohol yeah. oftentimes and so i don't think that it's it's a problem i don't think it should be treated as a, you know in is an illegal substance but then as you go up to harder drugs, you have to evaluate what are they doing and if they were legalized, what would the ramifications of that all be? And obviously fentanyl is just, mm. I mean, anybody dealing with fentanyl, I think, should be freaking incarcerated right. and be made examples of because you're introducing something that you know is likely to kill somebody. That's a different type of approach, right? Yeah. In, in, Fent in, in fentanyl is Russian roulette, yeah, right? totally. Yeah. And so, I don't know, it's, it's a complicated thing. I, sometimes I think that the problems that we have with the influx of these narcotics coming from south of the border, that, 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 that shouldn't be that hard of a problem to solve. You know, you, you just go in and execute the manufacturers. Like if you, instead if of you're precedent. not involved in it, yeah. If you're not involved in it. Right. Right. right? So, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's... It's above my pay grade to try to solve that problem. I do have strong feelings about it. I think a lot of things um, ought to de be de decriminalized. I love Amsterdam. Yeah, right? Right. And they don't. And, and you can go there, and you don't feel like you're in a cesspool of narcotic addiction. Yeah, you know, you yeah. feel like either you're in any other city, and you feel safe. And but yet, you know that people can go out and and get drugs, but they've chosen not to because. A lot of times, psychologically, we want what we can't have. The rush. The well, adrenaline, yeah. Well, and like the, the, the fact that it's criminal adds this component mm -hmm. when we psychologically want what we're told we can't have. Right. And so you go to a place where it's like, well, you can have it. And you're like, fuck, I don't want it anymore then. <laughs> yeah. You know? That, that's my kind of theory behind it. Yeah. Oregon, I didn't realize I was looked it up. Oregon decriminalized drugs. All of them? In November 2020, Oregon voters passed Measure 110, which decriminalized the possession for personal use of small amounts of all drugs. Shoot that up, Including there. cocaine, what? heroin, LSD, <laughs> methamphetamine, <laughs> and oxycodone. What? Yeah, I was looked it up. I, I don't know if you want to go full uh, fledged. Well, it'll 100%. be interesting, though, yeah. because that gets to be the test case for the rest of the country. Now, so as we watch this <laughs> evolve so this in Oregon, we're going to have a, we can use that as a reference point saying, well, Oregon decriminalized it five years ago. Their crime rate has not gone up. Um, their addiction rate has not gone. So we can use, this is great. 
So it says that this is writ- article was written in September of 2022. 22. This yeah. was passed in 2020. Wow. Um, ineffectual, even harmful claim of the black Including market remains state. vibrant. Uh, it said they don't think it went far enough. Uh, let's see if we can go to scroll down toward maybe here. We're at the end. It'll probably tell us. Well, I mean, we're not hearing anything crazy out of Oregon. Um, that's that's interesting. Here, this is the success of Portugal's law should be partially attributed to reduce, reduce prosecution of drug traffickers. This has not happened in the U.S. A spokesperson for the DEA said Measure 110 has not affected our work at all. Uh, step in the right direction. 5,400 fewer people were arrested in the 10 months after decriminalization compared to the same period in 2020. Um, that's just arrest, though. It's not telling us, like, deaths or anything, right? So if they implemented that in 2020, how long do you think you need, Greg, to go back and reevaluate and say— At least five years. At least five. You right? have to have at least five years of, of information to try to, you know— determine whether this is working and what is and what isn't working i'd say five years but it, again so what's interesting is because we will correlate things into the same conversation drug use versus a person who sells drugs right, right. see right. now there if you're right if you're selling drugs you're still done for i hear you. yeah One you're, you're still getting supporters more. campaigned under the success of portugal's 2001 decriminalization law which led to an almost immediate drop in portugal's drug death rate 110's critics point out that Portugal took years of repair by carefully shifting resources from criminal justice to treatment and recovery services. This has led to some say Oregon put the cart before the horse. So just get some NAD and Librium. Well, so the point, what they're trying to make is like, if you look at the Portugal study, it's like addiction issues and you're putting people, you're not criminalizing the addict. You're putting them into recovery. However, now you go down and you talk about the people that are actually the the traffickers. That's a different conversation. Right. Right. If you scroll up, they're still, they didn't change any of that. Scroll up. Yeah. They're still giving them the 20 year sentence for heroin and all that other stuff. Yeah. Because if you're trying to capitalize monetarily over people's addictions, that should be criminal. Yeah. Taking advantage of people's vulnerabilities and giving them things that are harmful. I think that should be prosecuted. But if you're an addict, I don't know that jail's the place to go. Well, we need to do anything. anything. It's, not, yeah. it's not the place to go. Yeah. You, you just sit there and wait until you get out to do the same thing again. There's right. no rehabilitation in any prison at all. And anybody who wants to argue me with that, I'll yeah. bring 30 people in. There's yeah. nothing. You go in, and unless you have your head on right, all you do is sit in there and talk about what you're going to do when you get out to make money. Mm-hmm. And it's never good. That's all you hear in there. Our system's fucked. Yeah. Well, they went privately owned too. That's that. That's what I think is crazy. It's complicated, but I love the idea that you mentioned earlier about uh, like organic drugs, the DMTs. And yeah. Like what can be done? Like I understand now that they're using psilocybin to treat PTSD yeah. Yeah. people in in military and other areas of life, yeah. where it's very uh, effectively helping people to kind of get that rewired. Um, you know. Uh, We've had a lot. I I can think of five or six Navy SEALs um, that they tried mushrooms that helped a little bit. I mean, and I'm talking traumatic stuff. And then they did DMT. And when they they came back from the DMT, different person, stopped alcohol. One was a full-blown alcoholic, really nice guy. I didn't, you know, I didn't know, you know, sitting here, but I, I talked to him, mm-hmm. did the DMT, bang, never drank again. Yeah, it's interesting. It's yeah. fascinating, actually, that, you know, whether it's rewiring or, re, you know, healing, whatever is the damage. at Because at, I understand people that are like microdosing mushrooms are finding themselves to, you know, they're not having um, hallucinogenic effects but it's dealing with their anxiety and mm-hmm. those type of things in an effective way. In fact, I have a, my sister is undergoing, you know, um, psychological therapy, and they're talking about introducing ketamine therapy, yeah. which I understand helps to rewire some of the. Oh, it works. Uh, it so works. I hear. Yeah, I, so, w- I was actually going to open up a ketamine clinic with uh, a doctor from uh, New Jersey. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize and all this mm-hmm. other shit. I. I Long story, but he passed away. But I was going to open up one with him down here. Really? I went in heavy study with that. That does work. 
So I understand. I yeah. hope it. I hope it does because uh, you know, if there's a way to, you know, if there's a way to kind of, because we all need help. <laughs> well, <laughs> Just the pro- different levels of it. Though. Well, see, the problem um, is like ketamine, NAD, all these things here in the U.S. Big Pharma comes in and they're like, "Oh no, no, no! Right. You're taking money out of our pockets." Right. Nope. Yeah. Motifinil that was a dollar a pill. Nope. Now it's fifteen dollars, even though it's been around They're the fifty years. Nope. No motifinil because you yeah. can't get addicted to motifinil, and that stops anxiety, ADHD, depression, social. Nope. Done. Ketamine. Oh, we have to stop SRIs that are just killing people and making them nuts. Yeah. You know, shut them down. You so know. So therein lies the rub. Corporate. Corporate America, America is going to have its way with us. And there's little we can do. It's crazy. It's it's sad. It's crazy. The part about it all is, you know, I mean, I drink alcohol, but you look at alcohol, for instance, right? And I know alcohol has killed way more people, way more people than marijuana and mushrooms, right? But mushrooms have that, like, oh, you know. You're going to lose your. Right? But they got all the commercials of kids drinking, guys drinking. And it's just amazing how that's socially accepted. But the other stuff isn't. I always find that amazing. Yeah, it's not just so it's promoted. Promoted, it became, yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it is interesting. Like I, twenty five years, I had in, I couldn't count the number of alcohol alcohol related incidents, car crashes, domestic violence. Right. Never once in my entire career did I, I was like, dude, you're just too stoned. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. you're just I I can't deal. <laughs> you're going to jail because you just or too high didn't happen ever once if you look every, so it's kind of to your point yeah, it's such yeah. a it's disparity weird. and everybody that i'm sure you've ran into and we ran into this high like high all day every day they're nice and calm people mm-hmm. like they're not doing anything mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. but what do you think about california now what a fucking mess out there boy yeah. I went. I used to go to the lakers games you know mm-hmm. when kobe was alive in 10 11 and 12 yeah it was all right then. What what happened? We just continue. I don't. I don't know where we're going because it just has gotten so bad in the the homelessness and the vagrancy and the tolerance for crime and like California has so much to offer, which is you know why we stay there. It's the the weather and the geography and there's just like so much to offer, but the circumstances are getting increasingly worse. You know. What, what we used to consider a felony oftentimes now isn't even an arrestable offense. And it's just gotten so bad. And the people that live in L.A. are like, we paid a lot of money to live in a nice area. And there's nothing that anybody can do about the vagrants in our front yard. And homelessness is a real issue. But people shouldn't be victim of it. And we've got to figure it out. And I don't think we will because, you know, our governor... And and the and the uh, the powers that be, um, they don't they don't suffer the consequences of the, no. the, the f- what are you guys paying for gas like five eighty six probably <clears throat> well to that six. fucking Newsom's got like eighty five cents for smog and this and that he was trying to talk his way out of it now he's tacking that extra two dollars on it's, that it and is a mess I would love to have been in California that's where I wanted to go yeah I this I don't. If Florida, California, yeah. I want to be in California. Yeah, me too. But not with all that craziness and the taxes and this and that. I mean, and it's it's it just doesn't seem like we're doing anything to curb that 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 that, that you know that progress that we're on. I and, don't know where it's going to go. And that's where I go back to to the drugs because you know California to me is the heart of bloods and crips maybe i'm wrong i don't know but that's what it seems to me sorry right if you take drugs out of that and you make them legal now yeah the gangs are still going to do what they're going to do but doesn't that plague them somewhat this episode is sponsored by aurora do you know what the fastest growing crime in america is for years this crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of americans i'm talking about identity theft and there's a new victim every 14 seconds Yet despite this, those who have had their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aurora, who is sponsoring this video. Aurora is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, 
password management, and antivirus software all into one easy-to-use app. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Protect you and your family from America's fastest-growing crime. Try Aurora for free for two weeks and see if you or anyone in your family's personal information has been compromised. Start your free trial today. Go to aurora.com slash MSCS. The link is in the description below. Yeah, it takes the money out of their pockets, on the, you know, because the illegal drugs is what funds a lot of the, you know, their livelihood. So you take that away. But now have you left a void where they've got to go rob now more than. Right. So that's the question, because they're going to find some way to earn. Right. right? Absolutely. <laughs> there, yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. That's what you got a mess out there. It is. It's now, a mess. But now, but disarming law enforcement is absolutely not the answer. That's the dumbest Fuck thing no. on the planet. Yeah. You're going to disarm them and then pay them less? Well, who are you, you know, the person that's cutting their pay, who are you going to call when there's a problem? I, I wish that that person has a problem and calls yeah. and, no, nope, I'm sorry, I can't come. Crazy argument. It, it really is. And it's such a failed argument when you think that, OK, we want the highest standards. Our law enforcement officers should be the cream of the crop. We should be recruiting from, a, you know, a, a pool of people that have high standards that are intelligent. And, and you I w if I were, I would like demand advanced education. But you're only going to get that if you pay according to what they could make elsewhere. And when you say, well, we want the highest quality individuals representing, you know, law enforcement, but we're not going to, you know, we're not, we're not going to pay, um, then you're never going to get, you're not going to solve your own problem at all. And, and now they're saying, we want the highest standard, but we're going to lower the standards in order to get you. Ugh. Like yeah. that's, <clears throat> how does this work? We I, expect the most out of you, but we're going to lower the standard by which you you get to apply. My friend wanted to be a cop forever, right? <clears throat> but his dad wanted him to do whatever he was doing with uh, their business that they had in Philly. Then finally his dad passed away and he's like, I'm going to be a cop. He goes, all this shit happens. And I talk to him and I go, so are you a cop yet? He goes, nope, I'm working at the fire department. I go, for 20 years you've been telling me you want to be a cop. He goes, well, I don't work for the agenda. You know, like he's saying, I, I wanted to be a cop for the people, right. not for the agenda that's telling me, don't do this, don't do that. So if I can't be a cop cop, I don't yeah. want to be an agenda cop. Right. That's not what I, that wasn't my dream. So now he's at the fire department and yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of other individuals with the same thought. You look across our country and the worst paid, like, like Memphis PD, Oof. you know, and it, like it's Memphis. just an absolute shit show. Right. It's just a shit show. And for all of you who might be offended by that, I'm just saying, look at what the stats. Yeah. And then you find out what they make and you're like, well, of course, it's a shit show. You don't pay them anything. They're not going to risk their life to make uh, whatever they're paying them. Like, well, you're not even be able to recruit yeah. quality people because yeah. they can go somewhere else and get more money doing something less risky. Yeah. That's yeah, like my buddy went to the fire department. Mm -hmm. benefits all that other stuff retirement gets to kind of be in the action not really what he wanted to be but at least they're not telling him no don't well, don't, it, don't resuscitate that person because you might get sued you know and the thing always about that is like yeah there's bad cops out there yeah there's bad you know restaurant owners there's bad everything you root them out. They get rooted out. It happens. Yeah. You know, there are. I mean, it's true. It's, it's true. It's unfortunate. It seems like it occurs more now than it ever did. I mean, it just seems like, you know, how... I'm still amazed when some cop is doing something stupid today and not knowing, like, everything's on camera. But I think... But like, I think how do you... How do you not know that your right, actions are going to be? Right here. Yeah, <laughs> it used to be in the old days. You can get away with stuff. Delete the shit. Bec there was nothing, nothing to delete. Yeah, there was well, nothing. nothing to delete. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I liked it better then. Give me a couple punches and let me go home. <laughs> but I think so. I think I think some of it though is is what you said. It it is training though too. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, you're put in a situation, and it's sometimes it's it's the f quick reaction, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you don't you don't know. But if you train properly, maybe the situation's different. But I just think sometimes, and I'm just speaking, I'm the, I don't know from just my opinion, I think mm -hmm. 
that the training is just maybe not up to par, but that costs money, that cuts budget, and we're going to mm-hmm. cut budget, so now we're not going to have as, as trained police officers. And it sucks for those guys, too. I mean, you know? Yeah. Uh, the training's a huge part of it. Um, and, and drawing people um, with qualifications um at the higher standards i think that that's the beginning of it all is and and you're still going to miss things like there's guys on the lapd that on paper look like this is this this is a perfect candidate and then of course in time you find out that they had gone down the wrong path so some people are going to get through it all or you know um you know you're going to there's going to be cracks in the system it's not going to be perfect but it it just seems to me that within law enforcement um you've got to f- the, the it's the emotional element that you have to try to, to and this goes to training mm-hmm. eliminate emotional responses and if you do if you're more robotic you're because un- this is what happens you lose your shit you lose your some right. guy says something or you're wrestling on the ground and you know you know maybe you have to punch him once in the face to get compliance or control but when you just start continually punching him in the face because you've lost your composure right now that's on video and there's no way to justify that Don't. and it makes us all look like right then that trickles down to yeah. every police station right. everywhere yeah. especially when you have everything going on that's yeah. going on so the emotional maturity of a person is probably the most in critical element in trying to figure out if a, a police officer should be out there handling real world problems and other people's problems and, is it's emotional so. and that would go back to the recruiting right yeah right and I, and I think a lot of it too is in general is just mental health because there's so many people out there that need help mm-hmm. and they're not getting it and now they're in situation i'm not saying what they do is right but they snap, they do whatever, and their cops are put in bad positions. They're, they're pulling up to scenes with somebody who's lost their mind. And they, they it's been documented they've lost yeah. their mind, but they can't get the help. You know, the, the family, and I know parts of my family, you know, you try to get the person the help, you Baker Act them or whatever mm-hmm. they call well, they can get out in, what, I forget what the time period is. Hours yeah, they, could let yeah. them, so they could sign themselves out. They need help. Yeah. And by laws and all different stuff, they can't get it. It just causes a bigger... The mental health is the biggest issue, in my opinion, in this country, and it just gets overlooked. But, yeah, I'm, w- I'm with you, Rob, you know? 100%. Where's yeah. Russell at again? I always forget how he... Bali. Bali. <clears throat> so Bali, r- r- we had Russell Simmons. I don't think he did any of the shit that they're accusing him of. I don't know yeah. if you know that case, but... Mm-mm. No, that's just some bullshit. He's in Bali, and, he, and out there, they have gun laws, like, strict. You can't have a gun. And he said it's the most... There's no crime. There's no nothing. What do you think about gun laws here in America? Again, it's complicated because we do these comparisons like, well, Portugal did this and right. it worked. <laughs> and well, our, we're not know, Portugal. Amsterdam did yeah. this or, you know, Bali does this. It's really, we're, you know, we ha- these are apples and orange conversations. And right. we have to deal within the own element of our country, which has a constitutional right to carry arms. How important is the Constitution? Do we override that with a new... It's it's complicated. Um, I think that gun laws, as, as they stand right now, are actually pretty effective. There are background checks. Criminals don't give a shit, mm-hmm. you know? And so you're never going to eliminate the access to firearms by a criminal. There's just too many of them in our, you know. There's, I, I agree with you. You're not going to eliminate them. And so the criminal doesn't give a shit what you impose as far as conditions to get one. So we do know that in areas where people are well armed to defend themselves, it's less likely that they're going to be a victim of a gun crime. Right, right. And, and if you ban guns, you're only hurting the person that mm-hmm. doesn't have that gun to protect themselves. Yeah. Be- and, if you, and if I want a gun, whether you ban it or not, there's it. plenty of places yeah. to go find one. So to me, you're just pushing it out to the street. Yeah. Now, as a homicide investigator or anything, now it's even harder because there's not even a chance that you could trace a bullet or anything like that, you know? Yeah. So that's my stand on it. I, I mean, Somebody sent me something today from New York where the NYPD just seized a huge cache of ghost guns, you know, untraceable guns. Mm-hmm. 
And so that's like the new, a new thing, which is going to be very difficult sometimes to solve crimes because so often we solve crimes through the forensics of a firearm. Um, so it, I don't know. It's it's complicated. I think that what we should do more of though is responsible gun ownership in the sense that if you have a gun, you should be required to qualify every year to maintain your gun ownership. That's a great idea. Be a gun guy that knows how to use it because the more familiar you are with it, the more likely you're going to use it in a responsible way. Right. And you're not going to be like this when, when the time comes. You're not going to shoot the bystander by, yeah. you know. But then they always go to like, they said like, and it's unfortunate, right? The, the mass shootings that we've seen happen. But again, if you go back and look at it, the person is not mentally stable. Right. And they've shown signs. And, it, you know, it's sad because after the fact, you know, a kid goes, shoots up a school, kills, you know, 20 kids. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you know, he was talking about this and he was making posts and he was doing this. So the, it's been there. Mm -hmm. And if they could have just got the kid help it may have prevented you know the tragedy from happening but we just overlook it too much you know yeah and we don't have that we don't have that the agency the element who's going to do that it's right. a it's a it's a mental health law enforcement deals with crime right mental health is not a crime so it's not a law enforcement problem it's a problem that's being unaddressed because we don't have the agency to to actually go in and do a proper evaluation now, now do police like when you were in when you were in there do, do police departments have the capability of um because you guys see some crazy shit right mm -hmm. i mean you're seeing stuff you're like oh my god people's brains blown out all that type of stuff i mean that takes an effect on you after a while is is there a good program set up in police departments where police can go talk to psychologists and you know because that's traumatizing it is there, there are, you know, there are resources where if somebody feels like they need to talk to somebody, but again, you're dealing primarily with an alpha male yeah, personality right, right. and an alpha male personality doesn't recognize their own vulnerabilities. They don't recognize their own need for help right. because you know, they're alpha. It, we're alpha. Yeah. So I, I don't need help. I can deal with this. Right. They don't even know that they need help oftentimes. So. Right. You know, first we got to be willing to see that, and and I don't know that we self police well, all yeah. the time. Yeah. Now, when you went to be a private investigator, was that if just looking at it, I would think that that would have been fun, because you could kind of do it on your time, take the cases you want, right? It's a double edged sword. Yeah, you're out from underneath the bureaucracy of a police department. You're your own boss. A lot of the stuff is really interesting, but what you lose is the resources. The resources, yeah. So in law enforcement, you have access to Fucking just everything. every yeah. system. And so you get a lot of, you know, it uh, uh, it, it works much more efficient, efficiently investigatively when I can access systems that are going to give me somebody's, you know, um, all of their personal information. You didn't, get, you didn't get a husband-wife PI job, did you? I've you did? A, oh, you did? I, I've had a few. Uh, he goes from Tupac and Piggy uh, to investigate somebody's uh, husband or wife. Greg, uh, uh, you let me down. Tommy, I got to tell you this. This is really interesting. <laughs> I've done a few infidelity cases, and what you I've picked them, you wanted to. Uh, yes. Well, no, sometimes you're just doing favors for <laughs> people. Oh, They're like, oh, I think my husband's cheating or whatever. But there's this, there's this, <laughs> there's this. There, there's this demonstrable likelihood that and then the they hear Greg Caden fuck that I'm done bitch leave uh, no here's ten grand fly away uh, Greg Caden's coming to town he's gonna catch us the person who is hiring you is more likely the one who's actually out committing <laughs> adultery yeah and they're projecting onto <laughs> their spouse like you guy I think she's cheating on me they need it for Ooh. court. <laughs> but it's it's it, it, it's a strange thing. It's like often I've figured out in adultery cases that the person that is hiring you is more likely the guilty party. <laughs> you go from, <laughs> from blood and crips blowing each other's heads off, 126 <laughs> bodies in however many months, <laughs> to infidelity cases. G give me a, a story of an infidelity one that Greg Cating did. <laughs> Oh, sheesh. This is all confidential. Yes. Yeah. Or, or um, just a PI case that was a. fun. Gosh, man, I've been... <laughs> I spent 
the better part, I had a, a client for almost 10 years. Oh, boy. And I have to keep this really general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had a client for 10 years um, who had a mistress and who was just obsessed with maintaining, uh, maintaining um, uh, monitoring. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you're like, the amount of money that was spent... <laughs> You for probably nothing. made more money on this drug haul than yeah. you did. <laughs> it, it, but the amount of money, Dr. and it, but this is interesting because it goes back to a mental health thing, where a person who has a um, like a jealousy disorder, right, an obsession, an obsessive Depo- jealousy yeah. di- disorder, yeah. and there's a reality in his own mind or her own mind that exists and then drives them to do the things they do when it's. It's actually a, a, it, it's a, it departs from reality. So this is the a case that I dealt with for so long, and no matter what you did or didn't do, because you never came up with any incriminating information, but they're still convinced. Oh man, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, <laughs> keep looking, and there's nothing ever there, and and you know it it becomes pathetic and sad. Yeah. Um, and you try to help people realize like, Hey man, you're chasing ghosts. There's nothing behind the curtain. Um, but you can't, yeah, there's some people you can't them. convince. Yeah. Did yeah. you have any good ones? Like any good private investigator ones that was what you're used to, not infidelity? Um, well, another thing and this, this isn't necessarily interesting, but I got hired to do cases where family members who's lost lost a fa- families who have lost a family member um through suicide mm. and then they just are convinced that there's no I way mm-hmm. that my son my uh. wife my husband, they're just absolutely no way would they have done that and the evidence is so clear i mean it's almost like you could have it on camera but yet they just absolutely in denial about the. Don't want to believe it. Yeah, and that's another tough thing to do, is to. No matter what you do, and they hire you to go out and you come back and you go listen. It's, the law. The 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 cops did a good job. It was the guy jumped off a roof, and he died when he hit the ground. And that's all there is to this. No way. Somebody pushed him. He got dragged to that roof, and somebody else did. There's no way. And, so you just get in the middle of people's deep, traumatic lives. And, and then when you tell them, look, he or she yeah, committed suffered. suicide, yeah. they don't want to accept it. They won't it. accept it. Yeah. And now that you, you, you know, yeah. they've paid you You're to tell them something different. News. Yeah. And you don't tell them anything different. Now you just feel, and then they think that, okay, well, we'll go find somebody who can get to the truth. And you know, that's what they did too. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. When you told them for the hundredth time that there's nothing to tell you, yeah. I'm sorry. It's sad. But they want to live with the hope and not accept, but that's that's a rough, mm-hmm. that's a burden to carry around with. Yeah. Now with all these, with that border open, with everything coming in, now are, are you like, this is just going to blow up and be a mess when everything gets together? Because as... They're coming through like we had talked about earlier. There's terrorists coming through. Nobody's ever talking about the terrorists, like as if terrorists don't exist anymore, that it's just drugs and kids and these poor families that just want a job in America. Meanwhile, the cartel's bringing everybody in. They run the show with terrorists. How do you think this ends up? We don't even know where they're at. Whatever tracking we had on what we had has got to be gone. It's I just, I think, For fucking I votes? think I saw it on, well, this is where it gets interestingly political. Yesterday I saw that they're sending a whole bunch of National Guard down to secure the border. Well, how timely? You know, all of a sudden, you know, we're coming up. Yeah. yeah, we've got an election coming up. We can now say, look at what we're doing at the border when you've been so complacent and ineffective for so long. But American, we, Americans, our society has such short memories. We won't remember what's happened in the last six months. All we're going to know now is like the administration's being aggressive to secure the border because voting times are going to they're going to use that as a platform uh, point. Oh, you mean when they look up from their phone for three minutes and they see, oh, the National Guard. Oh, he's doing something. Yep. Oh, I see. Yeah. He's strong on border policy. Back to the phone. Yeah. Yeah. And so. The the propaganda and the politicization, the politicization of everything is. We just don't have 
you know, a, a, as a whole, our, our society. But what are the repercussions going to be from all this? Well, do you, do you think we're terrorist attack is inevitable? I mean, because it, it seems to me right now, this is just what I'm seeing mm -hmm. that they're they got this dummy in there now, or they got a puppet in there now, right? And behind the puppet, they're telling the puppet, let them in to get votes. And they're not, you know, they're just getting everyone and everything that they can in now while they can. Then once that, you know, open door starts to close, whenever that is, whether it's in four years or eight years, then they have all the people that they want in. Let's yeah. get everyone in, everyone in. Yeah. Then once that door closes, then they start to organize right. and do whatever they're going to. They're not going to do it now because now is their open window. Yeah. Why, why put time into planning when let's yeah. get everybody we can over? Yep. So eight years from now or four years from now, when everybody's situated and done, boom. Then what happens? Right. What happens? What do you? What, what's what's the prediction? Big bad stuff. We control it. Is it controllable? Too right. Far gone. Is, is it too far gone? Is it beyond? Yeah. It's it, from the numbers. I, I mean, shit. So many illegal immigrants have uh, crossed. Just saying the, the, the numbers have. What do you to think? What do you think are the numbers? Take a while. Um, what in like the last really three years? Let's let's say two the last years? two years. Two years. The last two years. Um, I'd say I'm just gonna go with four million. Four million. What do you say, Austin? Well, I heard a lot of coming from China, so I don't. Even know. Yeah, I did hear that too. Uh, could be double that. Could be double that. I'm gonna say 18 million. Wow. I think 18 so million. So many people. And whatever that number if says, this number is going to be so we're gonna skewed by which whatever thing we're going to look at. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So just double whatever it says, right? If it's on Google, double yeah. it. According to Politico, illegal border crossings dipped to lowest level in over two years. Right. So, uh, yeah, I'm saying you're going to find. We're not going to find it right. Yeah. yeah. Well, however many millions. I mean, do you think it's controllable or out of control at this point? I think you can secure a border. There's no doubt about that. If you know, Correct. if the will four point nine it, million, there. according to one of the stats on here, eh, no, I'm in guy. the neighborhood. So we double that. We'll make that ten. Hey, this says yeah. this says four point nine million illegal aliens have crossed our border since President Biden took office. Oh, that's bullshit. That's according to this. Okay. You know, again, but even well, so. what's the right number? I mean, no one's right. out there with a clue. Well, you know, and if if we don't figure out how to legitimize voting, then there's four point nine potential. You know, voters. What you do you know? see? What do you see happening with that? Now, whether you like Trump or don't like Trump, mm -hmm. I mean, don't you? These indictments. Have you looked at them? Do you see any any? Forget that the guy's name is Donald Trump. Yeah, it's just the guy. Is, is there anything that you see that's legitimate? Legitimate that they would do to somebody else? I think the disturbing thing is, regardless of who it is, you're weaponizing the justice system to serve political purposes. That's clear. I don't think anybody can deny that. Whatever, you know, whoever you're targeting, it's still, it's, it's, um, it's improper influence, you know, and, and we're using our, um, our law enforcement branch of government to carry out, you know, political warfare. Doesn't that make you sick? It's horrible. I mean, it should I mean, be treason. Like, it's just absolutely horrible. And if they are able, and I think they could easily prove that these these collaborations and these conspiracies have taken place and people should be held accountable. I have no faith that that will happen. Yeah. I think it's probably just going to be more of the same. Do you think he goes to jail? Oh, man. I doubt it. The Georgia one, though. Yeah, I kind of, uh, man. New York. I don't want to be a false prophet, so <laughs> uh, I don't. I I just doubt it. I just don't. See, here's my thing. I just doubt it. Okay, so here's my theory, and then tell me your full theory. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I think I think he'll beat the federal ones. He'll find a way to beat the federal ones somehow, some way, because he could appeal it up to the next Supreme mm -hmm. Court if he doesn't like that one. He can move it to the next Supreme Court and on and on. Right. Georgia, he's stuck in Georgia. There's nowhere to move it. It's Georgia. Right. So you go to the Supreme Court, it's in Georgia. You yeah. can't move it to anywhere else. Right. That lady is dead set after him, right. that judge. Now, let's just say somehow he gets off. Mm -hmm. they, they find him not guilty, right? 
do you want to be that judge? The wall, say he gets found on one count, one shit count mm-hmm. that is nothing really. Maybe it's a fine. It's, I don't know, community service, something stupid. And she gives him just whatever and doesn't give him anything. Do you want to be that judge to walk in there and deal with the other gazillion people? And you're the one who let Trump off. Well, keep in mind, like when you go to Georgia and, you know, the, the, the nexus of the Democratic presence there is just Atlanta. Atlanta. You go outside of that and it's it's essentially a red state. Right. So if you're a judge, yeah, maybe the, the you know, the contingency of Atlanta doesn't agree with your decision. But, you know, I think that hopefully you've got the in, the fortitude as a judge to say, I don't care how I'm perceived. I have to do what I believe is my job. And, okay, okay. But now we're in reality. Well, no, I think that I think that that woman now I don't know who she is, so I don't. I can't talk about her in any kind of personal insight. Well, I'm just if simply you read saying, the if you read the counts, you would say, have you seen the counts? You're talking about the judge, or are you talking about the prosecutor? Well, I guess it would be the prosecutor and the and the judge because the judge was taking uh, portrait pictures before the indictment even came out. So that uh, so the prosecutor's throwing the counts, the judge is accepting them, which you essentially have to do because you have to let the process of law play itself out. You have to say, okay, well, you're you're the prosecuting agency. You're delivering me enough information to say that we should allow this to go and be evaluated, you know, objectively in a trial. I don't know if if the judge has been improperly influenced or not. I have no idea, but I hope that at that level um, that there's objectivity, okay. and then she just makes a decision based on the facts. Let's say let let's say she's influenced. Mm-hmm. Then what options does he have? Well, you appeal. You, and he appeals to the Supreme Court in Georgia. In the appellate court. In the appellate court, which would be away from her, and it's a red state. And it's a completely independent party. Huh. You see appellate courts turning over um, um, lower courts' judgments all the time. And then you have, the, you have the governor, right? The governor's a, a Republican, right, mm-hmm. Kemp? Yeah. So if, if anything happens, too, he could also, I don't know how it works with state, compared to federal but they can pardon. can he pardon then so oh he, he can, can pardon oh so maybe he, like maybe he can get out boom and then if the governor if he's still in at that time i don't know what his term when he's up but yeah mm-hmm. i think the governor can say oh great we pardon you you're good right. huh. well all right i'm with you then yeah I, I, I didn't for some reason i didn't realize that georgia was a red state well, it was and yeah it's because well it's like reddish like wherever. pennsylvania and back and forth there a little yeah. bit with, right now, yeah, and um, many of our of our states, you know, you get into the, you know, into the the suburbs, right? In the side, then it's you know, it's <laughs> yes. more practically minded people, in my opinion. <laughs> the cities have a tendency to see things through gloss, you know, rose colored glasses. <laughs> Who does California want? Do they want Biden again? Um, I, that's it's it's hard to say. Obviously. There was something that was said when Biden was running, and this was a very disturbing thing that a friend of mine, a Democratic friend of mine would say, he's like, vote blue no matter who. Like, they're just going party, right? right regardless right. of who the figurehead is. And that's disturbing. You know, the idea that I don't care who the person is, you know, or what their character is. I'm on the, it's like Bloods and Crips. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in for, it yeah. to win it regardless of... Huh. Yeah, it's and so I remember that it stuck with me. It's like vote blue, no matter who. It's like you don't have a an independent thought of your own. You're just buying into uh, the party lines, and it's like, man, if that's if that's as we and it seems to be that's who we are now um, across the board. Is you're you know you're either going to be voting Republican, regardless of who is in office right. and the character of that individual. Um, or you're going to vote Democratic because you're just going to support your party. Well, look what they're doing. I mean, they're crippling Trump with 10,000 indictments and civil suits. Yeah. They're suppressing Kennedy Jr. to death. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's being suppressed more than anything I've ever seen. I've never seen suppression like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he'd have a good chance, too. Well, they're scared of him. Well, they are scared of him. Yeah. But, you know, I, but who do you, who's your pick? Who's your pick to win? Not who you like, who you pick to win. 
I was leaning on DeSantis. I think he's done a good job with his state. I think he has the um, resume to be the, to lead the country. I think he did a really good job um, with Florida. Florida loves him. Um, and it's a very sought out a place, sought out place to live for good reasons. And a lot of that has to do with the leadership there. So I, I'm a, I, I'm a DeSantis guy. And then this Vivek guy comes along and he's very, very impressive. He's so articulate. Sharp. He's so sharp, yeah. but I don't know that he has the real life, um, r the real world experiences yet. I, th I think there's some, you know. Uh, maturation that needs growing, to take place yeah. some growing so i mean it would be an interesting card with him and trump together yeah um but he's young he's vibrant i think a lot of people can identify with them they see an intelligent person that's for sure and that's what we've been lacking for years is that figurehead who comes across as being like he's an intellectually um you know thoughtful well-spoken person so I think that that is going to appeal to a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, I, I understand that he's kind of overshadowed DeSantis in the polls. So it's going to be really interesting. Um, but then, you know, obviously the elephant in the room is can anybody overcome the, you know, the Trump brigade? Michelle Obama. Hmm. Mid-November. Maybe. Watch your calendar. Mid-November. Well, and then who beats her? Anybody got any names? Because I don't. I don't. Mm -mm. She wins. She I'd wins. put money on the table right now. Yeah. She announces in November and wins. Okay. That's what I think. All right. Um, I would like to see a Trump Vivek. I really would like to see a Trump Kennedy. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like. Yeah. You know, one of those two. Yeah. But it's going to be whatever they want it to be, I think. <clears throat> Their job isn't done. They've got to eliminate him, man, somehow, whether it's through this prosecution and getting him to where he's unqualified or or like what, uh, who was it that suggested that he has to be worried about an assassination. Somebody recently brought that up. Um, and uh, Trump? Oh, yeah. Assassination? Yeah, it was a question I think that was asked um, during an interview, and it was... Gosh darn well, it. Fuck, I mean, everything else they're doing to him, it's not working. I mean, they just right. hit him with another suit. That's today. the last step. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, they're running out. They're running mm -hmm. out of steps. I mean, four yeah. indictments, right. you know, 90 counts. And then Greg's the lead investigator. Yeah, in the case. <laughs> yeah next you know, you're going to. Yeah, like, hey, there Greg, we, uh, we got one uh, in Cali for you. I'm like, nope, not walking I'm in. I'm not touching one. that one. Fuck <laughs> that. Uh, you know, I mean, they're doing everything. So the last yeah. step would be to take him out. And yeah. they didn't give Kennedy uh, security. How do you not give a Kennedy security? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Your justice system falling apart, man. Mine. It's ours. Ours. Yeah, well, everybody's. Yeah. yeah, I mean, shit. It's, you don't give a, a Kennedy of all people who, you know, has some family members yeah. kind of just disappeared. Mm -hmm. You don't give them anything. I mean, you really want to. You'll do anything to keep this shit going, I guess. Yeah. Um Man, exciting days ahead. I mean, honestly, I mean, it's going to be so interesting to see how this all unfolds and, you know, does something really desperate happen um, or does it just continue to be more of the same? It's it's going to be really interesting. And what are you doing? Now? I think everybody has an impending sense of doom, like something catastrophic is going to take place in our yeah. country. I mean, there's just a that just seems to be a feeling that is shared, I think, with a lot of people. Now, do you think we end up blowing ourselves up through nukes, messing with all these wars, messing with Putin, who I don't know why in the world anyone thinks he's dumb. I don't think he's dumb at all. I think he's extremely smart. I think his military is a lot stronger than they're talking. He hired other countries' soldiers to go in. Mm -hmm. And to me, if I'm Putin, am I going to show my top guys to take out Ukraine? If you're Putin, are you going to really use your top guys to take Ukraine? A place that you want to take and yeah. not have to rebuild the entire thing. Right. Well, well, you've got to like the military infrastructure is is still wanting. I just don't think they have the type of equipment that they would need to carry out, you know, any kind of real front or real defense. I, I just don't think they have it. Um, and the, I don't think they're hiding it for future days. So I don't think that they have the ability 
um, to accomplish anything on a on a on a broad front. That's just what appears to be the case. Um, but yeah, I think he's very strategic, extremely smart. I think if you underestimate him, he's gonna bury. Yeah, and I wouldn't be. I mean, I hate to even suggest this, but um, when it looks like there's no hope in you, you know, with with the Ukrainian situation, you know, does he just push the button? What do you think? I don't know. I I'm, I shudder at the thought well, because of what that leads to. And I think, yeah. Well, you see him leaning closer to China. Mm-hmm. He's working with China with all that, with the oil and everything else. Yeah. He's got Serbia. I mean, he's lining up with the big Kim, boys. Kim Jong Un was just there. Was like, he last oh, week? Right. right. I mean, that's not good. Mm-hmm. Right. So now you now he doesn't need that military infrastructure because. His aid has his. He's got it all around him. him. Yeah. So it's it's scary in a way. Now, now, do you think that ends us, or do you think AI ends us? <laughs> One of the two <laughs> is going to end us, or the aliens, or the aliens. Oh, if you if you listen to Elon Musk, then yeah, AI is a real potential, you know, threat. Yeah, the guy who's making it to put in your head. Yeah, but I love the fact that he's coming out and saying, "Hey, this is something that we have to really regulate and figure out because it it you know." It can go to places that we didn't anticipate. Um, so I don't know. Or does do we um, where we uh, self destruct? Like not globally, but our country. You know, there's so much animosity um, in in Sorry. division. Yeah. Like, do we have some? Does something spark what leads to a civil war? I mean, we're headed that way. It feels like it. Right. And and that's what I think is going to happen. I think once these immigrants plan out and see what they're going to do, I think it's going to be mayhem, complete mayhem. But didn't the Roman Empire destroy themselves, right? They yeah. collapsed themselves. That's what I said. We're either going to kill ourselves or AI is going to take over and what's his name? Soros and all them are going to get what they want. Moving on. <clears throat> no middle class, no lower class, the elite. And robots. Yeah. I'm going they Australia. Have a, they're just waiting for that damn... You're going to be an Aussie. I'm going to go to Australia. That's Where would awesome. you go, Greg? Where would you go? Where, where's your... I'm following your advice. Oh, well, I've I've heard great things about Portugal. Okay. Yeah. Like, I've heard that's a really beautiful place to live. My son's really interested in going to Chile. Like, mm. he, he wants to go... And I Tommy wants that. to go, too. Yeah. I want to look through the telescope. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, both of those places would be interesting, but... Part of me also, like, wherever the shit's happening, I kind of want to be there, too. I want to watch. I want to be present in, in these historic moments. You get dual citizenship. So when somebody's about to hit the button, you go back to Portugal or wherever you're going to go. Yeah. and then After come- yesterday, I might switch it to Colombia, though. I might be switched. Oh, Colombia? Yeah, I remember our guest yesterday. Yeah. Colombia. Where would you go, yeah. Austin? Colombia. Colombia? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, you might have to go with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're gonna do a podcast? We'd like to, yeah. You're I'd gonna like to do say, a podcast. Uh, we well, how long have I been talking about it, and I still haven't done it? So when I say I'm going to, you know, it's in the works with a grain of salt because, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I think of I've, uh, I've cried wolf already too many times. I don't know. You got Austin here now to yeah, to get, uh, put his foot in your ass and get you to do it. It's a main motivator because um, I do have to have a a partner that's technically, you know, capable of doing it. You know, I can barely talk, much less, you know. Um, but, yeah, I would love to. I think it would be great to, to host this. I think this is exciting. I love conversations. Yeah. And right. even if they go all over the place. Yeah. It's, it's who, awesome. would be your, who would be your ultimate guest? Like, if you had That's one person one. you could pick right to this, have on right your show, down, Austin. who is it? <laughs> Doesn't matter the amount of money they might cost. If they're free, who would be the ultimate guy you want on that show? Pers- or woman, or whoever. That's interesting. Can I have just more than one? Maybe. Go, ahead. Can I Go three. Okay. I would actually love to interview Puffy Combs if he were willing to sit down and have a conversation. Because I would hopefully, I would love to. Um, not because I'm. I'll be there for that one. Not because I'm. Necess- Am I invited? Yeah. Yeah, we need to be there for that. <laughs> uh, would, Maybe I'll like him. Maybe I'll end up liking him. I would love to have a, a real conversation where he would be willing to sit down and be transparent and talk about these things. <laughs> and I think it would be in his self interest, actually. You know, just be forthright and go, yeah, this is the shit that happened. Mm-hmm. And it sucks. And I'm sorry that I made decisions I did. And. But yeah, I'm, I, I would like to come full circle with it and, and clear the air. I, I think it would be really a great thing if. 
if he would sit down and have that kind of conversation. Um, yeah, in your book or in, on an interview, you said if he was just, he should just tell the truth. Totally. Now, if he did, is there anything criminally that could be done? No. Not you that know I, the truth. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that there's there should be a fear. Of course, I think his lawyers would say, you know, err on the side of caution. Don't answer questions regarding this. But I think it is safe to sit down and be transparent and, and say, hey, I, I, I made some comments that obviously I didn't mean. I would never have hoped any of these things to happen. But yeah, I was in fear for my own life. The guys were hunting me down. I mean, this is what I think a real conversation with him would sound like. And I, I said things I shouldn't have said, and I'm sorry for what had happened. And, and yeah, I, 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 have, I have to take some ownership and some blame. I would hope that that would be the kind of conversation that would take place. You know what? If he did that with you, right? Because you're the head of all this. Break you the know? internet. Yeah, you would break the internet. If he did that with you, you would break it. And he wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't make him look bad. Who would? No. I mean, put yourself in his shoes and... If that's all he did, that's all he did. You got yeah. a crazy Suge Knight. They're going nuts. Yeah. You're at a party. You're out somewhere, and you're you're saying, "Jeez, I mean, how many times have we said that?" Just under our breath. This totally. woman is just. If she would just, what you don't mean it, but right. you're just like, if she would just not come home tonight, it would be great. Yeah. You know, this would be yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And then next thing you know, it happens, and you're like. Her brakes were uh, cut. I didn't really wish that. I didn't really mean that, Charlie. Yeah, I did you not know? cut her brake line. I, <laughs> I was just mad at her that night. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell I didn't mean cut her fucking brake line, yeah. buddy. You know, if he did that, you're right. I think it'd make him look a hundred times better. Yeah. I think he would blow up. I'm an older, wiser guy now, you yeah. know, is 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 the approach. But he'd have to do it with you. It have well, to I would love it. I would love. If it to wasn't have a with you, then it w it wouldn't be right. Because yeah. if it was with you, you're the head guy, so you're sitting next to him, and then he could say, "Look, under my breath, I was like, yeah, you know, we got to do something about these right. guys.'" And then you, as the investigator and everything, you could say, "Yeah, that's what he did." Right, and, and I under understand it. What, what the know? fuck, criminal is about that? Right. right? So. I would love to have also, I think it would be a lot of fun to, to sit down and have a conversation with Mike Tyson. Whoa. Mike yeah, Tyson? Yeah, Tyson. I would really love to interview Mike Tyson. Excuse me. Um, he would be awesome. I just think he's a fascinating person. And um, I like that he seems to be a little unpredictable. Like you just don't want to push the wrong button, but at the same time you want to push buttons. So he would be a really cool person to sit Super down and talk Super smart though. Yeah. Super. Anything history? Mm. I mean, he could rattle off. Is that right? Years, names, where's what, and if you're wrong, he'll bury you. Love it. Anything ancient, yeah, uh, like the pyramids, the uh, am, you know, the rainforest, mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. He doesn't have to look at anything. He knows it from A to Z with names and everything. Yeah. It's crazy, and. But you, you got better start rolling blunts because you're going to be smoking with him. You don't have to. You just have him blow the smoke. You get right. Oh, no. He'll make it. Contact And, he, yeah. and uh, he's still this big. And when you, you know, say you get him in, I don't know, six months. Yeah. And you see a video that he's sparring and he's punching at what, 90? Oh, so crazy. 95 yeah. pounds? Yeah, ridiculous. After sparring. After sparring. Yeah. What, what, 95? Yeah, 95. 95 pounds with his right hand. That's after sparring. Can you imagine at his age? The most fearsome guy I've ever seen in a ring. Yeah. It used to be, it actually, you just felt fearful for the guy that he was Scared boxing. Him, yeah. You're like, oh, he could potentially just kill you, and with, did, you know, with boxing gloves on. You like boxing, right? I do. Do you know what happened with that Holyfield fight, like, behind when, the scenes? When he bit his ear off? Yeah, do you know why? No. Okay, so prior to that, uh, there was Holyfield and Bobby Chez, right? Uh, holy yes. Okay, so it's Holyfield, Bobby Chez, whoever won that fought Tyson. Holyfield put hot sauce on his gloves and hit Bobby, and that's how he beat Bobby. Would he have beaten him that regular? You know, without that, I don't know. I mean, I didn't see it. I don't know, but like that's, it was getting in his eyes. It, was, yeah. it got in his eyes, and he couldn't see any, oh, and he knocked him out. And we had Bobby in. And to this day, Bobby can't... When we went to look at a menu, he can't see it. He has, like, a tough time seeing it. Oh, my gosh. So when Mike Tyson went to court for biting the ear off and all the other shit, Bobby testified on his behalf. Because he was doing the commentary, right? Yeah. Mm. Because of the hot sauce that happened to him, the same thing happened to Mike. But instead of Mike going down, Mike just went insane. 
and bit his ear off. So Mike believes that Holyfield had hot sauce on his gloves when he fought Mike Tyson? No, yeah, Holyfield got hot sauce on point. Mike Mike Tyson's face and he oh, felt it. Okay. And he had been warned about it prior and when he felt it in the adrenaline and we're talking about Mike Tyson in the most nuttiest time of his life, you yeah. know, just total kill. That's it. He just went for the kill. That's interesting, because when you watch the fight, obviously you don't know any of that. It just looked like Mike was getting so frustrated with Holyfield's style. Like, he just couldn't overcome Holyfield's style, which was effectively winning the fight. And Mike just got frustrated and, you know, bit him out of, you know. That's what I thought that and the headbutts. A lot yeah, of headbutts, that's yeah, what I thought. Right, but right. then when Bobby said the hot sauce, oh, wow. so Mike was trying to dodge the the hot sauce for a while, and then it got him, and then it must have got him good, and that's when he went. No more ear for you, buddy. Huh. <laughs> He'd be fine to interview. I, I think he's a, he's a really interesting guy, and I've seen him on a few podcasts, and he just looks like he'd be a great guy to sit down and talk to. And here's your third. Oh, and him and Puff could do it together because they know each other. Oh boy! And in yeah. fact, remember the night Tupac got shot? Yeah, Pac had introduced his song, introduced Tyson into the ring that night. Hmm. So there's a whole little, there's a whole little six triangle there. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. If you put funny. that together, that'd be uh, some shit. Oh, and here's another interesting. So, um, Keefe D knew Puffy through a, a Harlem guy, a, a New York uh, street hustler named Zip. Eric, that is Christopher Wallace's godfather. Wow. So Zip and Puffy really were really close. In fact, Zip's Puffy's dad was one of Zip's best friends. And so you have this whole New York connection going on there. It would be amazing to have all of those, both those guys sitting there because Mike can talk about his relationship with Tupac. Mm -hmm. We can talk about conversations that uh, Puffy had with Keefe D and, and then Zip being the kind of the common denominator in the whole story. Dude, that would be awesome. So that's your three. That would be cool. One more. Give me one more. Wow. Another one. Um, Tom hmm. Brady. Who's the GOAT in football? We always ask. Yeah. This. So, yeah, obviously Tom. Thank you. Um, in my opinion. He likes, in, he likes Joe Montana. Okay. Well, uh, not better than Tom. Problem with me is that I'm not enough of a sports guy to have a conversation with Tom at any real level. <laughs> I, I would just be like, "You're the goat. <laughs> That's it. That's all I can say." I mean, yeah. yeah, you're awesome. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't. I couldn't really have much conversation with him because I just don't know the game that well. Um, I'm trying to think of a girl. Maybe there's a girl out there I'd love to interview. Um, don't say Taylor Swift either. She's all over the Don't say, and don't <laughs> say, and, and you can't say Kardashian because she's uh, gonna yeah, ruin you. God, no, no. can I, I, Greg? If I hear Kardashian, uh, let me know because I'll there. fly out. And even though I'm little, nope. No, no. Every uh, fucking guy that comes near them is done for. No. I, uh, everyone, name one. Odell's near her now. Apparently, he turned his ankle. So. Uh, oh, Odell. Oh, uh, he's done. Say. Tristan uh, Thompson. Thompson, star, won championship. He's on the bench. Mm -hmm. Reggie Bush broke. Nobody could take down Reggie Bush. All of a sudden, he's broke. <laughs> Scott Disick, drug addict. <laughs> he been fucking ruined. You know, you know, Lamar Odom, Lamar. half dead at a uh, thing. You know one who I just I just reached out to. I no. just threw the shot in the dark. See if it see if we get a response back. Was um, Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton. So I love yeah. Eric Clapton. Yeah. Right. I grew up. My mom liked Eric Clapton. You know his whole slow summer. hand. His son died. He fell yeah. out the window in New York. Just he seems like an interesting fella. Like I don't know. I was like, Mr. Clapton would love you have on the show. So if you're watching this, Mr. Clapton, come on now. That would be a cool. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a cool get. I'd like to know what his, um, like what it was like with him having any conversations with like Jimi Hendrix, right? And other guitar players like Robert. Sure they um, did. Jimi uh, Hendrix, man. Jimmy Page, uh, and like there was those original guitarists. Sure, they talked. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Eric Clapton. Who who have you met that shocked you? Maybe even if there was a criminal, who have you met that that you were just like, wow, you're different than I thought, or you you're interesting. It's other than <laughs> other than <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Fiji. More than just water. This is not just rock. It's ancient volcanic rock. 
that filters tropical rain, giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water, it's Fiji water. Hey, <laughs> other than me. Um, hmm. I'll tell you somebody who's really friendly and doesn't have any reason to be because I'm not, but like Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. such a really genuinely good person. <laughs> yeah. So that was a, a, going along the, you know, celebrity yeah. things. Like Shaq was really, really cool. And he's the kind of guy that you can text out of nowhere and he'll return a text. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I think Shaq was, is really cool. I think he's genuinely a really good natured guy and likes to help people and do cool things. That'd be funny for you to have him on your podcast. Oh yeah. Shaq well, could be up to here. Or look at oh, wow. <laughs> you have to really adjust yeah. the camera on that yeah, one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what else are you working on? Are, are, you, are you like, what are you getting into? You're going to do the podcast. Mm -hmm. I'll text him once a week and push him to. Okay. And what else are you getting into? A couple of documentaries that are in the works. One, unfortunately, I, can't, I am under an NDA, but we're pitching that. It, it potentially could be a really great documentary. Um, it's true crime. has to do with, like, law enforcement. And then this other one, which I just recently have um, undergone the initial development for, is this serial killer. His name's Randy Kraft, and he's the serial killer nobody's ever heard of. And he's one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. He killed potentially 63 people back in the, in the 70s and early 80s. He got arrested in 1983 driving a car late at night. He got pulled over with a dead Marine in the passenger seat. And then they then connected him to the murder of a, you know, a, a, a number, a decade's worth of unsolved murders of young men. Wow. And he was this prolific... Um, hor like the, the way that he murdered people, you know, is up there on par with you know, the Dahmers. Really? Yeah. That's like, a movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a documentary that turns a movie. Yeah. And so it's a really fascinating case, and uh, nobody's really ever heard of it before. Um, but again, he's at that level during this period of time in Southern California, he was competing against all these other serial killers, Hillside Strangler, the Freeway Killer, uh, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And so for whatever reason, at this period of time, California was inundated with this rash of serial killers. <laughs> California is just... But he killed wow. more than <laughs> all those guys put together. And no one's ever heard of this guy. He's probably mad. What's the name again? Randy Kraft. And he's been on death row for 40 years, he got convicted in 1986. And he's been on, um, they call him the, the scorecard killer because he left this ledger that was discovered in the trunk of his car when he was arrested. And it was all these coded names. Yeah, that's Randy right wow. there. He's been on death row for 40 years. And of course, California abolished the death penalty. So now he's just gonna eventually die in prison. Um, but he just killed kid after kid all these young men now when that, i hear that so greg what happened to him that set him on that path bad parents he's got an interesting childhood but a lot of it was i think and i'm not a i'm not a psychological profiler but my own opinion he looks nuts. as an investigator um he had so much self-hatred oh. um he 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 left the air force as a young man Wow. Um, because back then, um, you could be dishonorably discharged for homosexuality. Mm. So he was a self-admitted homosexual. He left the Air Force. And then most of um, this, this series of murders that he committed were all these young men that he would pick up. And I don't want to give too much away. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, let me just ask this was it always military people that he was going after the the majority like if you were to take and build victimologies most of them were because they were vulnerable they were hitchhiking back to the bases in california mm. el toro marine base camp pendleton so he'd pick up guys um that were either frequenting known military drinking locations or he's picking them up because he could see that uh, this is a young, you know, now this is the 70s and 80s when everybody in Southern California was hitchhiking, mm -hmm. including myself. Mm -hmm. 
and I have my own story to tell about Randy Kraft. Mm -hmm. And um, um, he would he would profile guys, and most of the time he would guys get guys that are vulnerable that are have leaving a bar, and they're already intoxicated. And then he would offer them a beer that he's already got in a cooler in the back of the car. And then that beer is already laced with barbiturates. Uh, oh, shit. And so, hey, yeah, you know. Oh, what, me. Oh, me I, tonight. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I heard a one of the Marine victims of his made a comment like, what young Marine turns down a beer? Right. Right. And so he'd pick these kids up and offer them a beer. And of course, yeah, yeah taking me back to the base. Thanks. Appreciate the ride. You got a beer. Thanks. And they would take it. And before they know it, they're completely incapacitated. Ugh. And then he would use more often than not the shoelaces um, as ligatures to tie their hands. And then he would do these horrific things to them. And they would be alive suffering, but they're incapacitated because they're, they've got so much, um, Shit. You know, so many drugs in their system that they just are suffering through this horrific. When can I watch yeah, this? That? I don't know. Because there yeah. is shit on TV I am interested in. <clears throat> Everything I see is ID channel. Yeah. And sorry, girl stuff. Yeah. So I'm just right now I'm just self-developing it. I'm getting access to. That's going to be good. Yeah. Man. And, and you know, I want to do a forensic profile of him psychologically and and figure out, you know, the amount of rage that he had and the things that he were doing was that a reflection of his own internal hatred about himself like he was and we, this is a little bit speculative but he would use the old school cigarette lighters the coil push oh, yeah. in pop out mm -hmm. and like he'd be burning the eyeballs of his victims mm -hmm. and was that to prevent them from seeing him because he didn't want them to look at him yeah during these uh, these rapes um, and all in these assaults, I think he didn't want him to see him looking at him. Yeah, and he demasculate a lot of his victims. Oh. Like, why are you c c cutting off their manhood? And so it's a really interesting psychological study. Well, he was gay, right? He was. He was gay, and he was in the military. Mm -hmm. Then he left. So maybe somebody, maybe the guys in the military were making fun on. of him, right. picking on him. Right. So now. Get he's not just revenge. going boom. Right. He's torturing him because he's not like them, but that's what he wanted to be. Yeah. So because of that, mm. that's that's where I see that going. Dude. That's, yeah, this, that's now, a good one. can you go talk to him when he's on death row? Well, again, so they've abolished death row. In fact, everybody on oh, death yeah. row, which current life, it's just life, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but all the death row inmates in California were at a particular prison called San Quentin. Yeah. That's where death row was. But now that the governor, there's no death penalty. He's there's there no anything longer, out there. There's no longer a death row. So Fuck, all of I the lived people there 20 years ago, <laughs> he's going to be Just working kidding. at Chick-fil-A in California or something. probably. <laughs> so all the everyone that was on death row is being sent out to other prisons in California. Um, but he's always maintained his innocence. He's never really spoken. I don't know that he ever will. He might take his secrets to his grave, because, like I said, that scorecard that he kept, there's. Uh, half of the people on there, more than half of the people on there, have never been identified because they don't know how to decode it. Mm. And he's the only one. He wrote that for himself. These codes were just to remind him, oh, that guy. Here's how I would remind myself. Hmm. And so only he knows the truth behind all those codes. And he didn't know their names probably, right? It's not like he, maybe some of them, right? But it's interesting, the very first person on the scorecard is just identified as EDM. His first victim was Edward Daniel Moore. Oh, he did know. So sometimes he would. Maybe with their IDs or their identification. Right. Or maybe he did talk to them and say, what's your name? Right. Hmm. But then there's other things where the code is clearly just a location, like it would say Portland Head. What does that mean? And they did identify that he had killed people in Portland. But, you know, is 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 the head a bathroom? Did he go to the head somewhere? Or is it a guy that gave him, you know? Yeah. Could what, be. what is it? Cut his head off, who knows? Yeah, right? That That's right. what Austin suggested. Oh, he, and, and he did actually behead one of his victims. In Portland? No, oh, in California. Uh, yeah. I just always think How about far it. are you away from this? Oh, this is like early this development. Very early. I'm just oh, trying to find awesome, out. Man. Yeah, but I would really like to hopefully um, collaborate with a studio, somebody, a production company, that can help me turn this into a really good series because it's it's the serial killer you've never heard of. 
Yeah. I just haven't talked to Bobby. Mm -hmm. Maybe Bobby knows something. Yeah, yeah. Bobby B. Yeah, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Serial killers are, like, it's crazy to think about, like, not even a serial killer, but there was a a story I covered when I worked in the news years ago where a guy had killed his ex-wife, and he... (laughs) He ripped out all of her teeth. Wow. And then what he did was he cut her body up into pieces, and he buried it. Well, he put it in uh, acid, big tubs of acid, so she just disintegrated to nothing. And they finally figured out it was him, whatever, blah, blah, blah. He denied, denied, denied. And then he said, well, I'll tell you where she's at if you give me a lesser sentence or however the plea deal was whatever the plea deal was right. so the family really wanted the body mm-hmm. so they took the plea deal and the plea deal lets him out of prison i think he's in prison for 20 years or something i don't remember the number 16 to 20 years well when he took them to the body he already made the plea deal they made the plea deal technically there's no body left there's nothing left but it was probably pieces of skin and stuff and that technically counted as taking them to the body. Mm-hmm. But the gets, family just wanted closure. They just wanted closure. Yeah. Right. And he gets out in 16 to 20 years. I mean, can you imagine that? Mm. Cut the lady up, chainsaw, and ripped her teeth. I mean, that that takes work. Whew. Yeah, it's not easy <sighs> to dismember a body. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, sometimes the family just wants to know. Yeah. <clears throat> they just want closure. Right. You know, whatever. Totally. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. I can't imagine cutting up a human being. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know about all that, man. Cutting through all that, I don't know. That's, that's like the whole acid thing. Remember, that was this. Uh, that's just got the, that straight out of Breaking Bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, that, that's the easy way. Just <laughs> I can throw acid on this and be done. Remember when the in Breaking Bad yeah. when they they try to do it in the yeah. bathtub, but it all leaks onto the floor and then the, floor, right, the right, right. bathtub falls through the ceiling. Right. Oh yeah, I wanted to, one last thing. You know the Sopranos. You know mm-hmm. James Gattafini. Mm-hmm. Do you think they killed him? Tommy, I'm, I just I'm not a big conspiracy theory guy. I mean, it's got to I got to see really strong evidence to suggest that because those conspiracies require so many people oftentimes um, that like your suggestion earlier, you know, time doesn't go by without somebody breaking. Right. This somebody is, always some is going to say something. Yeah. And so when years and years and years go by and nobody's. Nobody says oh, yeah, I, I tend to not believe him. Uh, more than I am inclined to entertain them, but anything's possible. Yeah, you know, I think something would have came out. By Who would have killed? Yeah. Who would have killed? Well, because there was a lot of talk that there was a lot of talk that he had gotten talked to to not do the last two seasons <clears throat> because they were they were describing a family in Jersey to the T. I mean, like the spots, what they did, some killings that weren't known about, and. Supposedly there was a talk with him, but he did two more years. So then when he died, kind of suddenly, heavy guy, but kind of suddenly from, I believe, heart attack, that's, you know, that was just something that was thrown out there. Hmm. I just threw it out to see if you heard anything. Not that you would tell me anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. See if I could get like a flinch or anything out of it. Yeah, I wish. No No flinch. I I have nothing interesting to say about that. Strong as stone. (laughs) Yeah. Well, get that, get that, yeah. that get the podcast going, and yeah. more. Get this guy out. You get yeah. this guy gets rolling, buddy. Yeah. Whoa, that's like a that. good story. That's it's a really movie. Fascinating. That's a movie. That's a movie. Like, oh, uh, yeah. what was the one? Dahmer. Now, the, Dahmer was the one that everybody in the planet went to see. Ah, oh, I can't remember. He did the symbols. The Zodiac. Oh, the Zodiac, Zodiac. Killer. Yeah. yeah. This the, that guy's like yeah. the Zodiac Killer. You know, watching people love all that. I like that. What Dahmer? I got into that. I was oh, yeah. hooked I, on that man. I paid to see that. Yeah, yeah. The Night Stalker. That documentary was really well done. Mm-hmm. Um, Richard Ramirez. That was a really good one. And what's the guy that just got arrested in New York? Oh, uh, oh, New York. Was it New York? So not California had the Golden State Killer, which was the the ex cop that had killed a bunch of people, and they finally identified him through familial DNA. That was like a big, big case. They called him the Golden State Killer because the Golden State Freeway. Oh no, the Long Island guy, the Long Island Killer, or whatever he was, serial killer. What did he do? With that one. Uh, Shoot that up real quick. I'm trying to find that one. Long Island serial killer. I don't know. That's the guy that they just recently. They actually arrested him. Yeah, they 
they, wow. were, they were able to use his uh, oh. DNA. Uh, hold oh, on, yeah. let me pull it up here for a Cell second. phones and a pizza box. Yeah, they... They got his DNA off of a pizza box, yeah. probably. Yeah, so he threw something out. They've been following him for years. They had He was like... And they got him in, like, Central Park or somewhere. Okay. Oh, there you go. So, I received a phone from Baltimore. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm just going through it here. Yeah, yeah that's the guy. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he was big news recently. Yeah, he was Rex over the news. Um, what, read that, Rob. Read so that. it says... Uh, Exactly 16 years after the chilling phone call, Karn says she believes that the mystery voice was that of Rex Hewerman, a married father of two, a New York architect who was charged in the murders of three other women. He's the prime suspect in the death of 25-year-old, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he pleaded not guilty. I see. Um, here, he's charged with the killings of these three people uh, through Craigslist. Yeah, but they found him. I don't know where it's going to say it here, but they found it because of... of They've been thinking it was him. They didn't have enough evidence, and then they had DNA evidence on one of the victims, and he threw out a pizza box somewhere, this crust, and yeah. they got it from the crust. From the crust. Which is so crazy. That's yeah. so cool to me how they... <clears throat> they think there's 12 more. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say, are you qualified as a serial killer with three people? No. Yeah. No. Like, pretty... Is, is it two? Two? Okay. Is really? so a serial killer? Damn. Wow. Jesus. Wow, they're really that that's really low. The, the, the standards, <laughs> that's the standards really low of being a serial killer are not that high. You wow. Just do well, we got a lot of serial killers uh, yeah. that's sure that's a lot of running around shit. somewhere. Sure. <laughs> Man, I know a I know a dozen gang members that are now, <laughs> yeah. now they're serial killers. Just off the top of your head. <laughs> they probably be like, really, Greg? Yeah. High five. <laughs> <laughs> Want a blonde? <blunt? laughs> get that podcast going. Yeah. Start getting Thank this doc done. Yeah, and uh, get back soon. You were way yeah. too long. Yeah, thanks for uh, having How long has it been? About at least a year, maybe? Yeah, it feels like a year. It's got it feels like a year. you got to yeah. come like every three, four months. Yeah. Find time. Yeah, get, it a get away. Time. Right? Come out every three months. Come out every three months. All right. Mm. Take a break from. I just need uh, what? What? When is hurricane season? I'll just avoid. It's that. over now. It'll be over in November. <clears throat> I don't know. I've been here since okay. November. We're we're uh, yeah. November is the end of the hurricane. I've been here okay. six years and there's been nothing. 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 West Coast got hit, but never over here. Okay. I would have yeah. thought that this side of the not one time. No, me too. Twelve years, nothing. Twelve. Oh. Yeah, uh, so you're good. So you can't use that as an excuse. Yeah. So think of a better one. Yeah. Do you like your governor? Um, uh, yeah, but yes and no, yes and no. Okay. I do, but I don't. I I think you should stay governor. I okay. think that's where you should do, or wait a little bit. In my opinion, I in my opinion, I would wait. Yeah. I would wait if I were. Okay, so I'm going to turn the question on you. In the absence of Trump, mm -hmm. who do you like? Kennedy, I like okay. Kennedy. Yeah, Kennedy, um, and I and Vivek, but I don't think Vivek's ready yet. Right, I think he's sharp, quick, but I think he needs a little bit more schooled on what he's about to walk into. Yeah, but another maybe like in four years, eight years, if he does it again, I think he'll he'll be the the guy. Yeah, you know, hopefully. Uh, but I mean, with the choices there, if not Trump. Kennedy, if not Kennedy, I don't know, man. Because <clears throat> I don't think any of the other ones have a shot. I don't think Kennedy has a shot. Trump, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't see anybody beating him, but they can rig things. But I, I don't even think it's something to think about because I'm a hundred percent positive that Michelle's going to run and win. Okay. So that's what I think. But if she wouldn't, I guess Kennedy. I mean, there's not much to pick from. Who do you pick from? You got DeSantis. Yeah. Isn't that a sad state of affairs in our yeah. country where we have such limited choices? Like, why isn't there dozens of qualified leaders? Why isn't there dozens of people that we could all look to and say, man, they pick who they want? Yeah, it's 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 sad that we are that we are so desperate that our choices are the ones that they are. I, I mean, look at the choices. You got one guy with four indictments, and it's just a fucking mess. Mm -hmm. Even though I think his policies were good and things right. were much, much better, right. and we weren't in war, but he did do some crooked stuff, but they all do, he, you know? Yeah, and he didn't, like, in my opinion, and this is, uh, I think a lot of people feel this way, he was, he was great for the economy. He was good in so many ways, but we didn't have, like, he didn't feel like a dignified 
leader. Mm. Right. You know, you just didn't get that in my opinion. Right. Um, brash and, uh, you know, a little bit, um, uh, just reckless. And they also made it that way too, you know, coming yeah. at him with the Russian, Russian hoax right away. Yeah. And then the people he surrounded himself with, I mean, holy hell. Yeah. I mean, could you put more snakes around you? I mean, you could go to wherever and there isn't, I mean, every person around him was just setting him up. Well, that raises another question. You know, when you can't get along with the people that you've put into positions that are, that you're, that you're, and all of a sudden they are now against you, what does that say about who you are? Including your vice president. Right. He fucking buried you. So that two faced guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at like a pence, a two faced prick, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. A bunch of other guys that know they have no shot to win, but running campaign money to put in their pocket. Yeah. I mean, 10 of those guys know that they have Chris no Christy. chance on the planet. <laughs> I mean, you go, look, if it's not DeSantis, mm -hmm. if it's not Vivek, who is it? It's those two. Maybe what's her name? But she's I'm not for her because I know she's with, yeah. uh, she's with them. So I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not cool with her. Uh no. Tulsi? Lake. No, oh, not, no, not, not Tulsi. Tulsi. Who was she just was yesterday? Haley. Oh uh, Nikki, uh, Haley. Nikki Haley. There's so many yeah. there's so many of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, Nikki Haley. Uh, yeah. So to me you have Vivek, you have DeSantis, and then who? Yeah. Who would you want to run after those two? Yeah. Well, the experience obviously lies in DeSantis's bed. He's got the leadership he's got experience. DeSantis. He's got the leadership experience of Florida. Mm -hmm. But what happens when he gets in? Yeah, that's better than a guy whose yeah. leadership experience is in big pharma. That's true. Right. That's a fact. I don't know, man. It's like, like, like you said, it's just sad when you look up there and there's like, right? You got 10 that are just running for money. The other two are kind of like, I guess, there's no one that's like, that's my guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Who do you want in? I don't think I've asked him. I like, uh, it might be an unpopular opinion, but I do like uh, DeSantis. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just look at it all, in my opinion. I'm like, we've said it a million times in there. I'm tired of the R and the D next to names. I know you have to do it. I get it. Yeah. Um, I just, I just think people just look at that, and that's, like you said, vote blue or whatever your yeah. buddy said, mm -hmm. and they don't look at the bigger picture. Um, I think the Sanchez policies down here, I mean, Florida's thriving. We saw it during COVID. We saw the different things. I think he handled himself during hurricanes and, you know, things we had on the West Coast. Um, I think his problem is he somewhat comes off awkward to people sometimes, I mm -hmm. guess. And they say he's not really a people person per se, right? Like... I don't know. I think that say he's a crybaby. Yeah, I guess that's. They one say he's a crybaby. Knocks, he's a great big crybaby. Knocks really? against yeah. him, but I, I, was, I. I mean, I don't know. I don't know him. So you know, and then the other guy who's interesting, and he doesn't stand a dog's chance, but is. Um, I mean, I like Kennedy too. I do. I mean, he just tells it like it is too. I think his policies may be a little different, right? But uh, Tim Scott is an interesting one to me. He was really well spoken in the debates. Yeah, mm -hmm. I he's interesting. He really yeah, but I, I mean, yeah. it's 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 so he's there's. I mean, I don't know what his polling numbers. Yeah, look like, but I liked <clears throat> I liked him in the. You in know, the, I agree with you, but yeah. do you really think that he thinks he has a shot? Tim Scott. I mean, I like. I mean, yeah. I like him too. Mm -hmm. I like him too. But maybe he does. Maybe he thinks somehow he can overturn it. I mean, he's only down forty nine percent. He's got like one percent. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think the process is the is you're, you're discovering whether or not you have a shot, but you have to go through the process to to make that right. determination. Yeah. At this point, he's probably realizing no, but he wouldn't have known no until he went right. through the. And and you'd like to see the Santa son. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, um, it's unfortunate. Like, and this is nothing against him. I'm just going to use this this phrase because it's. It's like the lesser of two evils. Yeah. It's like if if these are the people that we have to choose from, this is the guy that I would throw my chips on. When you put it like that, who are we going to have president, Craig? The lesser of two evils. Yeah. It's, the president of the United States. Right. We're so picking I've, the yeah. lesser of two evils. Wow. Or one that can function. Austin, who are you for? <laughs> I saw RFK Jr. at Muscle Beach, so I was sold on that. <laughs> yeah. 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 At Muscle Beach. Yeah, he's benching. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him. Because I, I would. But no way it's going to happen. Yeah. They got him buried. Yeah, he got him buried. So they got him buried more than buried. <laughs> He's in the ground already. 
Maybe Matthew McConaughey will run there. Sometime. That is Matthew. so funny. <laughs> I swear I was going to mention I, him. I vote for him. <laughs> oh, that is great. I would actually vote for him, too. I think he's 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 smart, and I think he's balanced. and I think he, He'd get the woman vote, definitely, without a doubt. Oh, no offense, yeah. ladies. No, no, don't take that as a bad way. He'd get yeah. the, he'd get That's the right. You can't vote. say that now. He'd get the ladies <laughs> vote. Well, Greg, your uh, job thanks. in the next three months is to clean up California so okay. that I can move out there. Perfect. I because can do that. Because I found out that Florida's a racket. Yeah. It's a fucking racket. Yeah. Okay. So I'm ready for California. Just clean it up a little bit. Yeah, and and, and enough with it's this energy it. bullshit. This whole like electric car thing. No gas stoves. Enough of this. Okay. Coal. Doesn't that drive you nuts? Coal ovens. The whole electric car thing. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it, it 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 it's so you know, it's really interesting because um like I love the idea. We were talking about this earlier, um, about Austin believes that well, I don't know if he believes this, but he suggested that maybe it's not going to be too long before we don't even have car. We don't own cars. There's just services. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you summon a car when you have to do something. True. And Elon yeah. Musk had been talking about this for years is creating, you know, everybody has, you know, a, a, a fleet. There's a fleet of yeah. cars always available to all people and just services your needs. And um, I can see that. Yeah. But that would that would obviously lean towards you know, the electric vehicle market. Well, they'll have to go half and half. <clears throat> they don't have enough battery to make it. Even if they wanted to, they can't. Oh, it's impossible. Okay. So logistically, it's not. Logistically, it's okay. impossible. Got it. And then all this push for the electric cars, do you know what they put these people through to get that, what is it called? Lithium? The no, Cinnamon or what's the thing in the ground they need for it? Sort of the C. Whatever it is they need to make that lithium. Cobalt or something? Cobalt, oh, cobalt. yeah. Okay. That is, you take coal miners and multiply that by 10,000 as far as like long damage, mm -hmm. damage. Though getting that shit is worse than any China sweatshop, any coal miner, anybody in the ground. It is the worst job huh. ever. And they're getting no pay and they're dying left and right. But nobody talks about that. I thought we would have been by like the Jetsons by now and we'd be on the car, you know, the, the Jetsons. Like, yeah. I thought that was supposed to be now. Where are we? Well, Here I we just saw Back Jetson. to the Future 2 the other day and I'm oh, pissed. Great I don't movies. have a scooter board great or, or a fluffer board. Best, I thought Back to the Future was going to be right. Where's movies. the flying car? Uh, we we're maybe have some flying I, taxis. I know, we, I, know, I know we keep wrapping up, but that's one other guy that I would love to have on the podcast. Yeah. Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. I watched yeah. that movie. He just Still? Did. Was that what the documentary called? still? Oh my god! Isn't that something? So good, so amazing. You gotta see it. You gotta see it. It's called Still. Still, S T I L L. Oh, the Michael Fox story. Basically, it's it's his own documentary that he. It's so good. It's I'm amazing. It's so sad to see <laughs> yeah. his decline. Mm -hmm. you know and what? he had been suffering with um, uh, Parkinson's long before anybody even knew. He kept it hidden. Yeah, he, as a child actor. He, wow. he it developed very early in him mm -hmm. wow and he he was aware of it and did everything he could to hide it because he thought if it got discovered that would be the end the end so when he had when he did back to the future already yeah, really? yeah. yeah. Wow. he said he woke i think he said he went to in the movie in the document he went to sleep and when he woke up he had this weird tingly feeling or something that's when he first started realizing yep. something was up yep that's yeah. right it's good you want to hear something that's else i don't know if you know you know brad pitt can't see faces what he can't recognize faces google that just just so it it is as fact he he can't distinguish faces so, so he goes by sound so like he knows like okay you look familiar but who are you like he okay. what's it called uh prosa no idea what prosopagnosia a rare neurological disorder commonly referred to as face blindness He's never before you know, excuse me, he said in an interview with GQ that he had struggled for years to recognize people's faces. Isn't that crazy? Th that is disturbing because like he had no idea how hot Jennifer Aniston no, was. That's he had no idea how hot Angelina Jolie in was. In her prime too. He got her in like, the prime. He got robbed. Yeah. And she drove him nuts. She, she drove him nuts to fucking <laughs> alcohol and he had to go to Cooper and Bradley Cooper got him clean. If, if he had had the benefit of that, okay, they drive me nuts, but look how hot she is. Like, he doesn't even get that. No, that's why he went on a bender for three Poor years. guy. He couldn't see what he was... All he could see was five kids running around they didn't have a year ago. I just, uh, I just <laughs> love Jennifer Aniston's still my favorite. I still... I don't care. Wow, what a terrible disease to have. Yeah. 
Yeah, especially in your Brad Pitt, every girl on the planet wants you and you can't <laughs> see shit. <laughs> Greg, we're not doing six months again. I'll okay. see you in three. Sounds good, Tommy. Thank you. And get working really on that damn it. thing. I will, podcast. man. I'm and motivated. Podcast, podcast and everything else. You're motivating me. I will. I will. So I'll, I'll see you in I'll three come back with good news. Most. Yeah, after I clean up California. After you come to California, so we can move there. Yeah, small task. All right, great. Thanks, Thank brother. you so much. Appreciate man. it. Thank you, right. my buddy. Right. Thank you, all for coming. This podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra, Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart, or go to monsterenergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the Beast, Monster Energy.